Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the 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 Hi there, David, my fellow councillors. I acknowledge you all here today and thank you all for your attendance and your contribution. Karakia Fakatau Fakataka Tehau. Fakataka Tehau Kitiuru. Fakataka Tehau Kitetonga. Kia Maa Kina Kina Kiyota. Kia Maa Tanga Tanga Kitai. E hi ana ki anu te atapura. E tio, e huka, e hauhu, a tihei mauri ora. Cease the winds from the west. Where's it gone? Cease the winds from the west. Cease the winds from the south. Let the breeze blow over the land. Let the breeze blow over the sea. Let the red tipped dawn come with a sharpened ear, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day. Kia ora. Yes, thank you. Just affirm today that we as councillors will work together to serve the citizens of Salem District, to always use our gifts, our courage, common sense, wisdom, and integrity in all our discussions, dealings, and decisions, so that we may solve problems effectively. May we always recognise each other's values and opinions and be fair-minded and ready to listen to each other's point of view. In our dealings with each other, let us always be open to the truth of others and ready to seek agreement, slow to take offence and always prepared to forgive. May we always work to enhance the well-being of Solon District and its communities. We will. And so welcome along, and as Shane said, um, thanks to all the guests that have come along to, um, to be a part of this meeting. We've got uh, three public forum um, items that we will get to as well, but just first, the mechanics of the meeting. Um, I've had no identification of any extraordinary business other than what's on our agenda today, David. Nothing else from you? Nothing else, Mr. Mia. Uh, any conflicts of interest the councillors wish to raise that aren't already recorded on the register? Mm, been none. Uh, no. Variation the There's a variation item that you on, uh, on the uh, item. it's an item second chain second seal line. Great. Thanks, Malcolm. So is it for the three of us? Yeah. The three yeah. councillors yeah. who are commissioners would also like to raise that as a conflict. Thank you. Uh, and now we move to a public forum. So we've got three um Items. First of all, uh, Jens Christensen, uh, and the matter is around to other RTO. Jens, welcome along to the meeting. Get up to the front of the room. And we've got Anna and Max to um, present after uh, this. Uh, to uh, Mr. Mayor Councillors. Um, obviously, I was introduced up there, so everybody now knows who I am. Um, just on the issue of the Rolleston Residents Association request to council back in June or maybe July, one of those two J months, to add the word lobby to the TR, uh, TR building. And obviously, um, again, you'll all be familiar with the uh, public hearing that that matter has had. Um, we believed our request was to council, not to staff. And we've had two responses to our request from staff. And that was from um, initially Naomi in consultation with the group manager of community services and facilities, Denise Kidd, and ultimately upon his return, uh, David Ward. Um, both noting that the council undertook a significant process to establish the name to our tier. We're not um, attacking the, uh, the process, recognise that was um, full and uh, proper. What we are asking is that um, in line with um, a lot of people's, local people's requests that the English name for library and any other words you want to describe it put, be put on the building as well. My 
Booranger. It was mentioned by um, Denise Kidd. Um, doesn't include those birds either. But we aren't amalgamated with the city yet, fortunately. Double click, okay. That's it. But in fact, on the corner of Gloucester Street and Colombo Street, there was a signboard that does have the English words as well. Took me a trip to town to work that out. Other matters which have um, recently uh, appeared is the word library in it. Down the bottom left, I'll see if I can roll it up a little bit. There it is, the annual plan, Tara Tia Library. So the council recognises the building as a library. And that was from your documentation on the 28th of June, 2019. But it doesn't end there. Way around here, I'm sorry. Also, this document, Cell and Libraries, if you want to uh, participate in the um, Tiara, Tiara first birthday celebration, you go onto the website, Cell and Libraries. So again, it's linked, Libraries and Tiara Tia. Subsequent to the Residents Association discussing um, our, uh, our, our intended path on the rejections from those two staff members earlier in the uh, in the um, in the year, we decided that we would um, approach a council meeting and address the councillors so that perhaps they will decide to make up their mind on the way forward for this. Um, this naming, as you're all aware, the Selwyn Times um, floated the article. And the first edition after that article was um, went to print. There was 24 letters to the editor. The largest amount of letters to an editor on any single feature that the paper's ever run. 23 out of those first 24 letters were in favour of the word library being placed on the building. The fourth one, uh, the 24th one, was um, in favour of it staying the same, and I think the author is here today. <clears throat> Recently, I took a trip north. And went past a couple of libraries. The first one in Amberley. No, sorry, double click again. Library, Fotty Puka Puka. And Google tells me today that Fotty Puka Puka means library. Having gone through Ambry, I arrived in um, whoops, no icon's gone. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I got to pick them. And this is a uh, a very new library built within the last two years. I didn't get the full um, Maori name in. It's obviously not Fori Puka Puka. But again, it um, includes the words picked in the library at the door. So, Council, I ask your consideration, please, to include the word library in any of these iterations, be it the, similar to the Picton Library, on the entrance in a prominent place that at least library is identified. Um, at our last Residents Association meeting, 
there were other suggestions floated, no consensus. Library centre, library and cultural centre. Um, it could be a footpath sign or an AA directional signs as well included. Um, but anyway, somewhere please place the word library on Tiara Atia. Now, I can bring your attention to page 145 of today's agenda. And I haven't got it on overhead, I'm sorry. Page 145, second paragraph from the bottom. Yeah, a tier. Selwyn's new library and community facility. And on page 146, you will note the report writer as somebody who didn't want to use the word library with Tower Atia. So on that counts as I rest my case. If I could just have your indulgence on two other agenda matters today. And one I note is councillor appointments. Another I note on page 87 is the um, 87, yes, the, uh, the report on engaging with certain communities, residents, groups and community committees of council. I see the 19 um, um, identified groups as being recognised by council. But the concerning feature I note in this agenda today is the lack of council appointments to those 19 committees. And the note, I think, on the next page, 88, um, councillors, Melbourne community board members, staff may choose to join a residence group. If this is going to be an engagement with settlement communities and no appointments of councillors to be the, 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 the catalyst between council and the community groups, we might as well all go home and, and stay there and not bother going out at night. Council, we do expect and appreciate the involvement of council and the community. They bring us to us as all the council members. They are the culture between this organisation and the community. And I start mentioning that here. And I invite you to see in that report date to include those appointments. Any questions? Yes, that. Uh, any questions you've got? Any questions? Are you now asking to take up here or are you asking? I'm just a bit of pages, Peter. Um, I guess uh, in terms of the presentation that we discussed at the time of the meeting, we've conversed and met with the university to a memorandum of understanding and in terms of reference. I've been dealing with your checklist on that for the last few weeks. Um, I guess that will get some meaningful representation uh, between council and the uh, Technical Residents Association, um, and something that will be a benefit to, to both groups uh, and the community. Um, so I, I guess thanks for raising it, and and it's good to hear that it's concerned because um, it's something that we that we absolutely want to want to be working work, work for with the three residents of the three Rolston Ward uh, councillors uh, are, are excited to be able to reform not reform but to work out how how our representation works. Thank you, Phil. And I, I did uh, um, admit to, you, to to advise that our new chair, Manit Patel, was to be at this meeting and he sent his apologies, couldn't get here. Um, and I'm here in the position of vice chair, uh, had been acting chair for the last 18 months. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, just on the um, on the topic of the committees, I um, just wanted to know how often you feel that you would require representation from a councillor to attend, thank you, over a year. 11 months a year. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 11 months a year. Every, 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 every single meeting. Yes. And how often do you meet? How often are you meeting? 
Yeah, even once a year. Once a month. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, um, so in terms of, thank you very much, by the way, Jen, cheers for coming. Um, in terms of the location of where you would like to put a uh, library or any other words that were used to describe what goes on inside the Araatia, would something like um, having it etched next to the front doors on the windows or a big a sign on the front window work for you guys? I think the feeling that I'm getting from uh, residents and, and members of the association um, is that prominent on the building, but they would again, as a second option, certainly for second best, and as in the um, the Picton case, reasonable size letters at the door, both doors, mm -hmm. um, would be uh, their second choice. Thank you. Thanks, James. No further questions from anyone? Appreciate you taking the time and coming in and uh, raising that with us. And the second. Uh, Public forum today is Anna Clark. Anna. And guest. Anna, thank you for, for coming in and bringing your daughter um, to see us. Uh, this forum is a space for you to share your views with us. The microphone in front of you is just the right hand button you need to press to turn on. And uh, we are in the conversation. Can everyone hear me now? Fantastic. Okay. Kia ora, thank you for having me today to speak. My name is Anna Clark. I am a proud resident of the Rolston community in the Selwyn district. I am a proud wife, uh, daughter, sister, niece, mother, and friend. I am here to talk to the hot topic of this year one of the newest facilities of our town, Tiara Tia. First, I feel it is needed to apologise to the current, returned and new members of the Selwyn District Council for those who attack you personally with harsh and cruel words. You are human beings who will make mistakes because that is what we all do. However, you deserve to be treated with respect nonetheless. I would also like to apologise to the Committee of the Rolleston Residents Association for my actions and those and those of our community who have attacked you with cruel and harsh words. You too are human beings who will make mistakes because that is what we all do. However, you deserve to be treated with respect nonetheless, even if we do not agree. Finally, I apologise to those who are hearing my words now who do not agree that I need to apologise. But I do stand by that the words I need to start with are, I am sorry. Together with me today is my youngest, who say, whose favourite things to do with me are going to the local playgrounds, go to the cafes for coffee and fluffy, and maybe try and sneak a piece of mummy's treat, go swimming at the local pool, go to the cafe and tamariki space inside Tia Tia. She also loves climbing up the stairs, up and down, up and down and up and down at the other here and then go outside into the sensory garden to explore even more. The argument that has been presented to you today is that Tiara Tia is dominantly a library. Respectfully, I cannot agree with this. You walk up towards the facility and can see there is a cafe inside from Tennyson Street entrance or the beautiful eel sculpture and sensory garden outside the alternative entrance from the car park and reserve. Once you walk past these features, the toilets, one or two meeting spaces, then you see books as well as digital technologies to equip, teach and empower the young and old alike, workshop spaces, old artifacts, new beautiful pieces of artwork, or even different pieces of art artwork that gets you curious as to what it is about. Little hidey holes of comfortable chairs, couches, and the like for those who wish to hide away and work on whatever it is on their mind at the time. I personally have come more times to Tiara Tia for anything there except learn out a book or even pick up a book while I'm visiting. Friends I have spoken to have felt similar views of what they have done or attended in and around the facility. One piece of feedback I was told by another Rolston mum is there are still not enough children's books which I love, as I agree, there probably never will be enough books in any library space. Tiara Tia, I have learned, means unobstructed trail to the world and beyond. 
which I think is a beautiful representation of what this facility serves to the immediate and wider communities. I have heard a couple of arguments around the name. For example, Te Reo Māori is spoken by less than 2% on New Zealand population. I have learned since then that it is around 30% of New Zealand population that speaks Te Reo Māori. Additionally, Te Reo Māori, Māori sorry, is not only spoken in New Zealand, it is also spoken in the Cook Islands. My children are learning to speak it through their everyday learning at school and kindergarten, to which has inspired me to try and give it a go and learn to their Māori myself. I know there are many who have no interest in learning that, but that is okay. But to their Māori is an official language of our country, together with sign language, and I believe there needs to be a balance of these languages respectfully in our community without losing the beautiful identity of Rolleston and Southern District which is of kindness, caring, uplifting, empowering treasures of our history while embarking into the future, raising up the following generations to do better, be better, and pursue all things they are passionate to learn about, give a go, all while looking after what we have around us, the land, the water, the cultures, and the languages of this beautiful nation. Another example of the arguments I have heard would be, a library takes up most of the space in the facility, so it should be called a library. Respectfully, I would question this. I wonder, are they counting the floor space only, or are they including the wall spaces that have also been utilised, like the green room to prepare museum pieces for display, the pin board and the tamariki space? The sensory garden outside as this is an outdoor extension of the facility, the amazingly huge projected display along the curving walls, the artifact and art displays along the walls and in the middle of some of the floor spaces, performance spaces, meeting rooms, study nooks, couches, larger tables for groups of young people or young people at heart to sit around and study and socialise dream. I am aware that Rolleston Res Residence Association is concerned for the name choice because it is in Te Reo Māori. Respectfully, I am also aware that they initially requested the previous Southern District Council to not name this very, say, this very space library and community centre since there already is a facility called Rolleston Community Centre. This, to me, makes complete sense. I cannot agree that the English word library should be put up beneath, above, or beside the name Te Reo Atea on the side of the building, simply because this would give those who are not familiar with Te Reo Māori a very big misrepresentation of what the name of the facility means. I also cannot support nor disagree that something needs to be added. I am essentially on the fence, as there were a few other different ideas that perhaps deserve some further investigation or consideration. The reason I say this is, I am wondering about those in our community and wider communities of New Zealand who are proud to call this country their home. And yet English is their second language, or third, or fourth. How difficult would it be for them to work out where to find the library inside Te Aratea? I do not know. From a tourist point of view, I would like to think that they would like to experience New Zealand authentically for all that it represents of its heritage and history, including our Māori and European heritage alike. However, I remain confident and sure that the name Te Aratea is all-encompassing of what the facility is. This beautiful and unique facility is a multi-use space for a range of different people and their needs, a cafe, a museum, a hangout spot, meeting spaces, study zones, play spaces, and a library. Thank you for your time and consideration. I hope this helps you to make the best choice on behalf of the whole community of Rolleston and beyond, the young residents, the elder and the in-between, the ones who have been and yet to come. Thank you, Kia ora. And I thank you very much for coming in and, and sharing that with us today. Um, Councillors, are there any uh, questions that you have? Um, hi, just just wanted to clarify. So you feel that it shouldn't have anything as the picture example was given to us in the previous slides. Because um, so there was uh, something written next to the door. So the, the Maori word name was the um, prominent feature. And then there was a small bit which said library and 
community service centre or, or something of that, along those lines, would you be opposed to having something like that uh, put on it in any place on the building or signage nearby? I think putting putting library on the glass doors on either the entrances or both would be a good thing to consider. But I don't think it would be right to put it right up on the big prominent sign that's up on the high up on the building that says Tiara Tia, because my worry is that that would be giving people the impression that that's what Tiara Tia means when it doesn't in English. Thank you for that, Phil. Uh, Anna, thanks for coming on. Um, I'm not um, Thanks for the apology at the beginning and taking on board. Thank you. Um, and I just want to thank you for having the courage to come along and actually um, um, speak your words. I don't, I don't have a question. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone further? Sophie. Um, just one quick comment. You have a beautifully behaved daughter. Um, I know that my children would not cope with this. Um, she is doing awesomely. Oh, and Phil has provided a gift for everyone. Oh, no. Sugar. Thank you. Thank you for coming in uh, today and presenting that to us. Uh, we'll be considering all the public forums uh, once we've got uh, through. We'll have one more to go. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public forum speaker is Max. Uh, Max, welcome. Max Lolly, welcome to the meeting. Max, as, you, as you've seen, this, um, we'll allow about 10 minutes for this conversation, a chance for you to share your views, and there may be some questions that councillors have. Um, we won't um, debate the issue with you today, um, but we can to hear your views. So thank you for taking the time this afternoon. I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, councillors, thank you very much for uh, providing us with the time to talk about this. Uh, it wasn't something I really thought too much about until such time as um, one thinks about it. I, mean, I guess I came about this for a roundabout way. But um, yeah, it's the, my concern is that we came here and shifted into this area maybe 18 years ago. I live on the corner of Eden and Selwyn. Uh, we came here because it was quiet. And um, at night, we could hear the railway line, the trains going on the railway line. Now we haven't got a hope of ever hearing that. It's you just hear the rumble of traffic coming out of Ralston. Now, that's not, a con that's not a concern. That's growth. You've got to live with it. So that's okay. But um, What's happened is that the build up of traffic going down Wheaton's Road towards Christchurch is quite significant. Uh, so on the road towards Christchurch, when I talk about so on the road to Christchurch. And on that corner, we hear speeches in schools maybe once a day, and uh, the place is a disaster waiting to happen. Someone's going to get killed there. And that's of concern. But what's of greater concern, and I've, been, I've put this down in bullet points on the papers that have been received, but I also talk to it generally because you can go through that in, in the appropriate time. But um, one thing is that really sticks out is that you built a bike park over the road, and I commend you on that because it's a brilliant place for it, and I've got grandsons here just busting to get into that. I saw someone around there biking the other day, and my grandson saw that there would be a bit of a flood going on. But the trouble is, where that bike park is situated is on the edge of that corner, and it's quite frankly bloody dangerous. Um, how do you get from Ralston into that bike park? Uh, I just thought you might have to maybe do a tunnel under the road to get them in there because kids are coming down here, they've told us they're coming down, and they want to go to that bike park. And they're going to turn around and um, they're going to cross the road. Who do you cross the road there? Do you come around the sweeper that is went to Ralston Road, around that big sweeper there? And you've seen there's a kid sitting in front of you crossing the road somewhere. Where do they cross? You're going to have to build that into it even before you open the bike park. Even if you wanted to come down, um, come down Regan's Road, that road onto Regan's Road is. Riders, not exactly the widest road in the world, and I'd be uncomfortable seeing my grandchild walking down that road. I'd sit with all the backpack and tell maybe take your chances with the traffic. You've got a problem. Now, 
my initial interest in this was the fact that um, it's impossible for me to cut those trees on the corner readings and so on because it's once again you, you, you're coming to a big corner, the whole lot like that, and getting the trees cut is just impossible. So I, the original, original request was to talk to the council about that. I, I um, sent an email through which I got a copy of to Mr. Maisie asking about that to cut the trees. Well, he said that cutting the trees is the least of my problem. Because by 2029, those trees are going to be gone and it's going to be part of a roundabout. Well, I applaud that. I'm quite happy to work with the council to going towards that. Uh, so, you know, when I look at the one at the, towards Shams Road, that might, that's a big roundabout and helps the flow of traffic. It seems safe to me. I don't know these things, so, but it seems safe. So I saw you to get onto that. Well, it was amazing. Um, suggested that it would be finished by 2029. Okay, what? Uh, we need to move a bit faster than that. And that's all I can say is just we've got to move faster, we've got to move much quicker than that um, to get on with it. Another thing that's just happening is that people have a habit of parking their cars and trucks in the ditch outside my place. Um, Last Saturday, I came through there and the bottom photo you see there has got a photograph of a car with its back into the ditch. Now, for me, so I took the, the phone out and I took a photograph of that. Maybe because I was, I was there, I took one of the, the top, first of all, I'll do with this one. I took a photograph of that and the lady said to me, What do you think of that? And I said, I've got no space on Facebook at the moment, I haven't done anything for ages. And she didn't think too much of that. And I said, what I'm doing is I'm trying to be a bit of a portfolio. But that car, according to you know, the, the guy from the um, car recovery outfit, suggested that that car that will now be written off. That's a reasonably modern car, because the ditch was hot at that time, and it's got original through it. And the other idea was to get out of the road of another car that was completely behind it and just went into the ditch. He never saw the ditch. I've tried mine inside of the ditch so people can see it. I've tried in the devices, but they insist on putting a car in there. Now, well, it's either done with a U turn where they come down, you can't do a U turn on seven roads, so you've got to do a U turn on around the corner, you've got to get around there somewhere, and you've got to be able to back around. The thing's unsafe. The truck that you see on the top photograph is one with a load of chocks. And the photo took the wrong turn and turned around, went to background, and put it in the pitch. So we're getting, we're getting vehicles around the other side of the place. When the bill came in at 3 o'clock in the morning and tapped them up, I went and said, I got stuck outside, sir. Can you come and help us? I said, yeah, so I've got a tractor. I'll pull you out. So I pulled him out. And my wife went, look, she said, how can you do that? So I said, well, look, for goodness sake. So we I pulled him out. But I had a slab of beer sitting around the thing by 7 o'clock in the morning. The guy was happy, so was I. But I'm not doing that sort of routine now, so I think we've got to do something. Um, so there we are, that's something that's going to happen, and it's down to you people, but I think 2029 is far too late, and um, I know it's all about budgets and stuff, but really it's going to, and it's going to be difficult, there's big power lines, there's all sorts of things, but to, to pull it back that far is ridiculous. Max, thank you for coming and presenting that to us. Uh, access to Reed's Pit and the bike park there is something that we have um, spent quite a bit of time considering how we provide safe access uh, to that spot because we agree that the current way of getting there doesn't feel as safe as, as it needs to be. Um, and that is included in thinking about the development that will go between um, Rolleston and Reed's Pit currently on the other side of the road. So there's a few things to, to happen in that space, but thank you for raising that with us uh, today. Um, the, there's also, um, when we think about the way that we're going to travel safely between places, um, it's a, it is a high priority for us. So thank you for, for coming in. Uh, are there any questions of the presentation? Grant. It's not a question, just absolutely agreement. I've sat there in my car and nearly wiped out, and I absolutely agree with what you're saying. So thank you for coming and telling us that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time, and we'll be discussing this in a moment. Councillors, I wonder if we just review those two matters that have been put 
before us today and just think about our direction um, as we move forward. And uh, obviously the first batter around Te Ara Atea, uh, it would be good to have some advice, David, around some other, uh, well, a report to the council looking at uh, the path that has been taken to get where we are and options, uh, including those put forward to us around where we might go moving forward. Um, and if council has got some specific questions, I'd like included in that for any consideration. Um, that's one way that we can um, move move that forward. Is any councillors got any views around what they would like to to see as part of this discussion? Um, next up, uh, Bob and Elizabeth. Yeah, not so much on that, but I think we really are looking at the stage where we need a policy. On this, this is a one-off, mm. but. I'm looking at all the buildings throughout Selwyn. We need to be uniform in whatever we decide to do. Right. And I think that would be most important so that people could rely on the same sort of signage, whatever it be, on, on all our buildings. So I'd like a report on where we'd go with that. Thanks, Bob. Are you requesting around bilingual signage on everything? So it actually goes both ways. If we're going to have English signage on things, actually lifting the Tadeo, um names for those places also needs to be there and, and vice versa. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, just I'm concerned with the specifics. So for for me, there's two, two things around the signage. One is I think it's good to have signage that we know um, the drivers can access while they're driving past because often you'll have, like the people mentioned, out-of-town visitors coming through and they want to be able to see it on the road. And secondly, uh, pedestrian, so that there's some smaller signage which just points in the direction. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. So that's sort of wayfinding um, signage that we could uh, grab. So I think we're in danger of making a mountain out of a molehill here, really. I mean, the, the submissions we've had are relatively modest. They just said, can we have a library sign on the door or a street sign? That doesn't seem to be a major imposition to anyone. I think, why wouldn't you do it? It just seems um, you can make it a really major issue if you want to. But why not bring it back to a space level? It's just information. It's not detracting from the name of the building. Um, let's be a bit more pragmatic about it and, and, and um, just move forward. Don't make it so it's a big deal. That's probably exactly what the report will do. Yeah. So, so you know, the comments you got? Yeah, no, I, we will bring back to the March Council meeting a report on meaningful um, building signage on council owned buildings, but also directional signage as well. This is more than just one building that we're talking about. Target that for the March meeting, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, and the second uh, matter around uh, roundabout on Selwyn Road. I wonder if we request that the next. Um, well, that's that's going to uh, be a part of the wider discussion around our annual plan, long term plan. Um, but Murray, if you could cover off where that's going to sit at the next transportation update, which is a regular update, um, it'll either be to the first meeting of this committee or the first sorry the first meeting of the. Um, new committee, uh, depending on decisions in the next half hour, uh, and update the, the council at that point around a way forward. I'll just give you a quick update if that's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Lodge is correct that sitting on 28 29 and the 21 24 long term plan, that's where it was sitting. But I think we need to be cognizant that um, uh, recently we've discussed the Waka Katahi, the Ended Up program. And that's going to change considerably the required work around Rolston. And there's going to be some pressure on being able to fund all the intersectional improvements we need to do. So uh, we just need to be cognizant as we go through. So I imagine there will be a 24 to 34 long term plan discussion. And you'll cover that in the report back to the committee. That'll be great. Uh, Malcolm? Yeah, um, I'm just concerned that in the meantime, we know how dangerous this intersection are. Most of us have driven it. Uh, and I'm very concerned about. Um, uh, young people trying to access it wobbling on their bikes. So if there's anything we can do as a stopgap measure uh, in the meantime to streamline access and visibility for our youth and for people in general wanting to use Reed's Pit as well. Because that is, is, as Max has said, that is a real issue for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is one isolated uh, intersection that's dangerous, but when I moved here, I noted how many dangerous points we have in Selwyn and was very surprised by the amount of traffic um, and really serious car accidents happen at intersections around this district. I think it would be actually good to just have a really good audit on what intersections are quite um, notorious um, and just to make sure that we are our safety game on those. 
and that will form part of the discussion around prioritisation of projects through the long term plan. Uh, Sophie. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask if Marika or somebody could possibly include in the report back, because uh, last term there were discussions around having a crossing point up the Lincoln Rolston Road area from the, the bike lane and on that side of the road around the sweeping corner so that if kids wanted to cycle to the bike park, just wondering where we're at with that particular aspect of it, because that would help take users for the bike park off the road. Thanks, Sophie. And Grant. Um, as an immediate action, I think the speed limit's 80 k there. Why don't we whack it down to 50 straight away? Move it the other side of Selwyn Road. The 50 k zone starts on the other side of the intersection. But I, I think that's an 80 k. That max, yeah, it's max is, it would be an immediate action we could take straight away. At least reduce the speed through that area would be the first thing I think we should do. Thanks, Grant. May you consider those things as a report back to us. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks everyone for coming in um, and present those three presenting to us. We'll now move on to the other items uh, on the agenda. Uh, first of all, is a confirmation of minutes from the 23rd of November. We'll move and seconder. Malcolm, seconder. Yeah. Bob, thank you. Um, are there any changes or notes people want to make about those minutes? All those in favour that are recorded as true and accurate, say aye. 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 Anyone against? Declare it carried. Uh, the next item is the Chief Executive's report on page uh, 23. So um, a number of concurrent reports, Mr Mayor and Councillors, that I want to talk to. First one on page 23, so we have the Cord AGM this afternoon. These recommendations are procedural just in terms of um, proxy voting and acknowledge comments. Firstly, the reappointment of um, the Auditor General uh, to do the audit for the company, reappointing Board members Pat McKevity and Murray Harrington as per a council resolution of 14 uh, September. And in addition to the board, which we have discussed and are currently in the process of going through that appointment and setting the director's uh, fee for the next financial year. Happy to answer any questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Deborah. Just one, the remuneration, is it an increase from um, previous years? Uh, the remuneration previously was for um, directors. It's based on five directors and a 5% increase opposed to the fee. Thanks, David. Any yeah. further? Oh, sorry, sorry. Deborah. Sorry. So, um, unlike council remuneration, they do not have a block remuneration that they share between them? Yeah, they um, do. Yeah, they do. And, that, and that's what the recommendation says 228375. So, there's a differential applied to the chair, and then the other currently three, but shortly four directors will receive a, a flat fee. Okay, and there's been an increase in that of so much percent last year. Yep. Anything further on this report? All those are in mover. I move. Thanks, Shane. Seconder. Thanks, Phil. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Anyone against? Declare it carried. Uh, next is on tab 8 or page 26 of today's agenda, Chief Executive. So this is my uh, monthly report. And what I really want to do is to take the opportunity to publicly acknowledge three key external appointments. Firstly, uh, acknowledge and congratulate Mia Broughton, who has been elected as Vice President of Local Government New Zealand. Congratulations, Mr Mayor. And acknowledge Councillor Shane Epihar, who was recently elected uh, to, as the rural and provincial sector representative for Team Marawata. So both quite significant uh, appointments. So well done to both of you for that. Also in my report, I've acknowledged the uh, recently signed relationship agreement between Council and Taumutu Runanga, uh, which we signed in late November, acknowledging areas of, of work that uh, we are doing with each other, strengthening the relationship that we have, and at the ceremony, the Renanga Chair, Liz Brown, acknowledged the agreement builds on an already strong relationship between Council and the Renanga. The agreement acknowledges the roles and responsibilities of both parties and sets out structures for how we'll come together just to engage in an enduring and collaborative manner. Piece on uh, building consent accreditation, which has been renewed. Uh, piece on the Lincoln Railway Bridge. And finally, Mr. Mayor, some delegation changes to reflect recent changes in uh, staff positions. And we just need to have that adopted to make sure we've got that appropriate uh, delegation in place prior to the holiday period. So, again, happy to answer any questions. Recommendations are on page 26. 
Right, thank you. So move and second that for this report. Welcome, move. Sophie second. Uh, this is that we received a report and also approved the additions and alterations to the delegations manual. Any uh, questions for David on this? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Anyone against? Third carriage. The next item is tab nine, adoption of Canterbury Local Authorities Trail Agreement. David. And again, Mr Mayor, relatively procedural this matter. Um, legislation requires local authorities to enter into a triennial agreement after each election, but before the 1st of March the year following. Purpose of the documents to ensure appropriate levels of communication, coordination and collaboration between local authorities in the Canterbury region. So there are 11 councils from Kaikoura in the north to Waimati in the south, uh, as you were to Waitaki in the south, and of course in Byron and Canterbury as well. The agreement um, included on pages 35 through 41. Um, the agreement's got to include a number of things, protocols for communication and coordination between councils, process to comply with section 16 of the Local Government Act, applying to significant new activities proposed by regional councils, and also the process and protocols by which councils can, can participate in identifying, delivering and funding facilities and services of significance to more than one district. Again, happy to answer questions on the agreement, Mr Mayor, but this is a standard agreement that we've been signing annually for a number of years. Thank you. And just to note that um, Chair of the Mill Forum is Mayor Nigel Bowen of Timaru, and the Deputy Chair is Mayor Murray Black. Uh, from Hurunui, uh both elected and opposed at the recent uh, Kendry Mill Forum meeting. Uh, I'm on with uh, that we adopt this. Is there a second that? Elizabeth, thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favour say aye. Aye, aye. Anyone against? Declare it carried. The next item is tab 10 or page 42, committee structure in terms of reference. David. So this one uh, proposes a change of direction from, from council. So for several years, councils adopted a committee of the whole approach uh, to governance matters. Post this election at its uh, retreat, councillors discussed opportunities to review this governance model and uh, consider the introduction of four committees of the whole with delegated responsibilities. In discussing the model, councillors were keen to pursue opportunities for development uh, in, their, uh, in the governance roles, aimed at increasing the breadth of knowledge that they've got individually on respective activities of council, and also a strong uh, desire to introduce Renunga representation to the council table. So the proposed model sees four committees of council established with their own terms of reference. So those committees are Community Services Committee, Finance and Performance Committee, Planning and Climate Arrange Committee, Transport and Infrastructure Committee, and Audit and Risk Subcommittee, uh, being a smaller committee of council. There is an appreciation that strong um, growth will continue across Selwyn in the future, and that coupled with a number of legislative changes which are coming out of us, out of Wellington will require additional input and detailed knowledge from our elected representatives. And we believe that the terms of reference will enable committees to take a more detailed approach to that. We acknowledge that this model will require additional secretarial support. Mm -hmm. To what degree, I couldn't honestly say at this stage because the committees haven't met, haven't reviewed their terms of reference and the breadth of work will be at. I'm confident in my own mind that that, that uh, workload will increase over a period of time. We we'll also propose Runanga representation, one each from Taumutu Runanga and to a Hariri Runanga. And if council resolves to invite Runanga representation, so the council and committee tables, the mayor and I will prior to the end of this year and more realistically by about this time next week, um, prepare a draft job description, identifying roles, ability to speak, voting rights and levels of your remuneration that we can give back to the respective for an owner executive for their consideration over the next couple of months. It's expected that those roles will extend to attendance at councillor briefings and at site visits. Appointees will be expected to be bound by legislation, code of conduct, standing orders, 
um, and they will also be present at council meetings, or they will not count as part of a quorum and will not have uh, voting rights at the council table. And finally, Mr Mayor, just an acknowledgement that um, firstly, this structure is proposed to be reviewed uh, twice in the next 12 months. The first one uh, at the council meeting of 19 July, the second one council meeting of 13 December and noting that the representation review process will also kick off during the middle of next year. The Local Government Commission has directed that we undertake that for the 2025 election, so that will mean that we'll need to kick into it around the middle of next year to make sure that we follow a due process and become gazetted on time. So happy to answer any questions uh, for the benefit of members of the public. The terms of reference have been um, discussed with council rules on a couple of previous occasions and also peer reviewed by council's executive team. Thanks, David. Uh, I think that in a district that's changing, it's good to look at um, governance and how we govern um, decision making for the council and offer opportunities for change uh, in that as well. Uh, acknowledge that, as you said, David, there's a couple of review options. I think it's highly unlikely that when you change something, you land a perfect first time. Uh, and so look at how um, the terms of reference might change and the shape of committees might change over the next 12 months is important. Um, rather than getting into detail around the terms of reference, if there's some small stuff today that you think ne might need some further discussion, that will be one of the first agenda items on these new committees when they meet, will be to um, review their own terms of reference and make sure that they're adequate, which will enable time for things to settle over the next couple of months until we start the first meeting uh, in the new year. Uh, I am excited that these committees will provide the opportunity for councillors to take um, on some different roles within council and to provide some leadership and extra voice into the decision making um, that we take and to work closely with staff uh, and provide some extra space for consideration of the work that we do as a council um, rather than them all just being um, at a council meeting. There'll be some particular focus um, that will be brought to uh, the things that fit within the realm of Selwyn District Council. Um, obviously, continuing with the work that we've been doing um, with our Manifino partners, uh, the good examples that we've had of them sitting with us at the front end of decision making um, has meant that we've had faster decisions at least cost to this council um, in our community um, with a richer range of um, conversations right through. And so look forward to that being um, a part of how we function across more areas as we as we move forward. Uh, there's a number of uh, questions and comments people want to make. So open the floor to Deborah and then Lydia. Thank you. Um, for transparency, um, this matter was discussed in a workshop. Um, it would be fair to say that the choice is a mere choice. It wasn't, um, while it might have been agreed to by the majority of councillors, um, there were some councillors who were expressed concern. Um, myself being one at the increased cost um, of this committee structure um, and wish to find a new way of actually reducing those costs, um, perhaps working smarter as we did in the previous training with um, supporting co-governance. So I just want that recorded in the minutes brief for transparency um, to highlight for, for the public agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Lydia. Um, I too, yeah, had reservations about um, expenditure on proposing this structure. Um, but I just know that subcommittees are not open to the public. And I wanted to just question why this is public excluded. Um, and should the public have a right to hear what was being discussed as they would have had an opportunity if it was a full council yeah. meeting? Um, if voting is happening at committees, if that is not the case, then yeah, why? So it's not, they, are, they are all, they are all these subcommittees are public meetings oh. and all public meetings will have the opportunity for a public forum as we had today. And so matters relating to items on those agendas, if there is a public forum, will be dealt with um, at those meetings. So if there's something in that we've confused in here, let's make sure we get that right. Back. They are fully public meetings. Yeah, cool. I just yeah noted in the public forum, it's yeah. expected that public forum will be restricted to council meetings. The plan will be to have public forum available at the at these subcommittees as well. Okay, great. Willing cool. to yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Shane. Uh, kia ora, tēnā, tātou. 
titiro koe kite tiri tiwa watani mama hara inga kore ro mana fe noa mai tiri wo hiki hiki aroha tiri ti crown apology um look at the risk of persecution of my uh, fellow members here um deeper your right uh and to allow for mana fe noa representatives to contribute in accordance with the treaty that uh, has been signed in the past, or well, actually on the seventh, eighth generation of uh, two of the top signatures there to protect, participate, and uh, partner with our with our uh, partners. So, in the spirit of that, I think it's uh, an opportunity, as we've seen through um, the conversations that have been had today in the public presenters, uh, that there is a gap, and to ensure that uh, that gap is closed or tightened then we need our partners to be in the room and we have the conversations of a gifted name uh, and the meaning of that name. Um, but also there is a responsibility uh, both ways and if there's a partnership to happen. I think um, the quarter all that's been presented, Sam, the opportunities that um, uh, the four committees uh, propose are needed in a time when we are moving quickly out of what council used to be, the, the three borders uh, services entity bill has been a result and we're moving quite quickly so in order for us to benefit from some of the decisions that uh, those around the table that are here today and present have left for us as we stand on their shoulders it's going to require bold decisions for those of us that sit around the table today uh, to come up and find a more sustainable revenue stream for our uh, generations moving forward i don't want to take up too much time but i just to sort of summarize the conversations that have been had already i just wanted to uh, bring that to the attention uh, the proposals offer a great uh, offer a greater depth to which councillors can explore efficiencies and exploit greater opportunities. I'm fully aware that there is an increased cost to do this. However, I'm conscious of the fact that if it, it is broke, it does need fixing to some extent. Uh, uh, the change, uh, the three borders entity bill, the loss of the asset alone will create uh, will require new brave decision making, making and partnership with our partners. Unlikely to a hikiki and like to a hudidi. We cannot move forward without having a commitment, and it will require a commitment from our Manifino partners uh, to be active and participate both ways. Um, I support this, and uh, Sam, as has been said, it has been in your power to appoint these committees. And if you so choose to, then I will support that, um, being fully aware of the conditions and also the extra costs that will be created. I am positive that. Um, well, I put my mana there to say that I will do all I can to, uh, with my fellow councillors, to ensure that there is still uh, accountability to be efficient, uh, prudent uh, stewardship of the assets that we've all contributed to into the future in partnership. Kia ora. Uh, acknowledging again, as I said in the uh, briefing, that is within the, the realm of the mayor to to appoint these committees as this is right. But um, I too, like Deborah, I, I oppose this. I I think the first thing I opposed it on uh, was that uh, the construction of these committees will create confusion for our ratepayer groups as to where the decisions are made and what meeting do you attend um, to understand the decisions being made. So that's my first point. Um, the audit and risk committee. I'm certainly concerned about the paucity of of Council law members um, having two um, council law appointees seems to be light for one. It's a significant committee. Um, I also um, am really concerned about the increased costs. I suppose in this era of high inflation, it's clear that this this new structure, um, doing the math, is going to add about at least one percent of general rate. I don't think it's prudent to do that, and I'm, and I'm sure that our um, rate payers are not, are not unless they see immediate and sustained benefits from this. Um, structure. The six month review will end up being 86 um, back to where we started. So, um, certainly concerned about that. I am concerned um, also for our Runanga partners. If you notice in the paper, um, the expectation is that our Runanga partners will attend full council meetings but have no speaking or voting rights. That's quite insulting that you'd sit here, and listen to the conversation, and not be able to participate. The way forward, as I said at the briefing, is that it should go through a proper representation review process which is uh, you play straight back to this and you actually allocate full rights um, through that process and the community gets to actually dictate it. I feel the process that's being undertaken here 
um, while it seems immediately beneficial to our Runanga partners, um, probably in the long run, actually creates a, a situation where you have frustrated members sitting there going, why am I here? Because I can't speak and I can't vote. Um, so particularly at the council meetings, I understand at the committee meetings they will be able to, but um, the real power happens at council meetings, the decision making, doesn't it? So those are my concerns. Um, on that basis, I'll be voting against. Yeah, um, I, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. I have some reservations, but at the same time, you don't try it, you never know. Um, with regard to uh, my federal representation and, as Grant's pointed out, the representation review that's coming, I actually see this as enabling a better representation review in that sense because it gives uh, the Runaka um, an opportunity to, to demonstrate what they can bring to the table rather than it be the debate then being had as part of representation review in a vacuum with no evidence for or against. So in for that particular section of this, I'm fine with it. Uh, the cost does worry me, um, but at the same time, I guess, with additional committees, um, in theory, we should be able to actually enable better transparency in some ways. Um, so yeah, so it would be it'd be interesting to see what the re the first and second review come up with, and if we end up going that, we'll just go back to the old way. No. That's fine with me. If we keep going with it, tweak it a bit, that's also good. Thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I think we, we learn from both our successes and our failures. So wherever this goes, we'll grow as a council um, because of it. Uh, I'll just note that the Lurinanga don't and didn't want to go through a process to have proper representation with voting rights at our council. Uh, and it was their decision to not go through that last time around. Legislation doesn't have a pathway that they were happy with that would allow them to have voting rights at council, but they're more than willing to be a part of thinking about what does it mean to sit at the uh, subcommittee level and fully participate and vote at that level. So there's obviously going to be an ongoing discussion with them about council and subcommittee and where those th things sit. And I agree with you, Sophie, that having them here for the discussion about the representation review might open up other pathways rather than the very limited legislation that we've got now that allows that discussion to happen. I have a mover and seconder for this report. Shane, welcome. Thank you. Uh, all those in, I'm not going to speak. In, in seconding this report, I too share concerns. Um, I notice uh, retired Councillor Jack Pearcey sitting in the back row and uh, James Christensen as well. And both of those councillors were at the time when we had separate committees around the, the, the council, I think. Um, I do, they were committees of, of a whole, of everybody. Uh, so I am supporting this to take it through six months and we'll look at it again and see how it goes because I think there's a real opportunity here to uh, grow the abilities of our new councillors around the table uh, and for, to become better future leaders and that's what I'd like to see. Thank you, Malcolm. Any further comments? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Anyone against? Aye. To carry it. You like the recorded graph? Yeah. Thank you. Deborah and Grant would both like their votes recorded. And Lydia. Great. The next, anyone else? The next item is on Councillor Meeting Schedule, uh, tab 11 and page 73. So, so Mr Mayor, given the outcome to the previous um, resolutions, this now becomes a machinery motion. It sets in place the meeting schedule for those committees for the next 12 months. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this? We're fairly happy to move. Yeah. Seconder. Thank you, Sophie. Any discussion on this? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Just, uh, that in, just that in um, page 73 and 2, it actually mentions only about a one-year trial process. I think you said that there would be a review in July. Um, so I'm just a little bit, you know, um, this report talks about a one-year trial process versus a six-monthly trial yeah. process. So through you, Mr Mayor, yes, there are reviews on those two dates I mentioned before, which were, I think, 19th of July and the 13th of uh, December. The reason that the report on page 73 refers to an annual thing is when we adopt our meeting schedule, we've got to, we've got to adopt it for the entire 12-month period. Rather than just for a six month 
I'll so if there are changes in July, yeah. then we'll be making amendments to the meeting schedule for the second half of yep. the year. Make those decisions at the time. Any further questions on the meeting schedule? Or basically, I like to say every Wednesday, councillors will be expected to be here. There'll be a range of different types of meetings. Some will be on site at communities throughout Selwyn. Some will be meetings in here. Some will be briefings. Some will be external presenters. Uh, and some will be meetings like we've got today. Great. All those in favour say aye. aye. Anyone against? To carry carries. The next item is on page 77. It's the schedule of councillor appointments. So this, this reflects previous discussions that councillors have had around uh, desire to be appointed to uh, either functions or external bodies. Page 79 and 80, I think I've captured it all correctly from our previous discussion. I certainly haven't had any feedback from anybody, Mr Mayor, since the agenda went down. Thanks, David. So this is the range of um, either external, um, outside appointments, or committees that we know we're going to need to set up and have external, internal um, appointments set up. It just means that when staff are presenting reports, we need some people to be in those draft reports. There'll be some names that already sit alongside recommendations uh, in those staff reports. Any comments or changes? Moved Malcolm, seconded Bob. All those in favour say aye. Anyone against? Declare it carried. Uh, the next item is tab 13 or page 81 of today's agenda. It's a joint district licensing committee. Uh, Malcolm Johnson, welcome along to our meeting. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for the report. Despite um, our challenging year, um, the numbers of applications, alcohol applications here uh, for 2022 are actually higher than what they were pre COVID. So that's really good news. Um, all the news is that the Good Home in Dribbling is now open and Kiwi Tavern will be opening in February. So that's all good. I'll take the report as read and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, any questions you've got of this report or comments you'd like to make? Yep, right. The Kiwi Tavern licensing, did that get into the proximity or safety of being so closely associated with the road frontage? When you drive past, or is that not a part of the licensing? No, not not area. Uh, yeah. no. I know what you mean, then. Uh, Phil, hey, how are you? Hey, uh, you've um, you work for um, the, the alcohol for uh, around the whole area. H how are we faring in alcohol in terms of alcohol harm in in, uh, in Zealand at the moment? I would say alcohol harm is uh, quite low. Um, yeah, we're operating in a, a very a good district and high compliance amongst alcohol, so alcohol harm is very low. Um, we're not getting quite the drink driving places coming to us from the police anymore. Um, and our levels are very good. Thank you. Shane. Uh, Thank you. I'm welcome. Just noting the, um, the Lincoln University garden party is always well attended. Um, great event. Uh, long term uh, for the event to proceed, uh, mitigation factors put in place. Or perhaps a different venue. Yeah, I think there's going to be a hearing next year no, for the next application. There will be a hearing with the district licensing committee, um, and there's going to be some mitigation certainly put in place by um, Lincoln University in terms of actually approaching some of these problem addresses um, prior to the event, and um, yeah, setting down some rules and uh, rules on. Mm. Thank you. Anything further? Mover and second for the report. Thank you, Lydia and Phil. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Anyone against? You're right. Have Merry a good Christmas. Christmas. Thanks, Melvin. Merry Christmas, yeah. Uh, before we move on to the next report, which is Denise's, David, do you know just um, the timing of this afternoon's meeting and the agenda item around chlorination requires um, Bill Bayfield is joining us? At, yep. Can you just update us when that's happening? Yeah, that's Carmel? happening at 2.30, Mr Mayor. So wherever we are in the meeting, acknowledging that we've got an external uh, participant, we will break out of that debate and go to item 19, I think it is, which is the chlorination discussion. Denise. Okay. Uh, so now on the reports to Council on residence groups, this is on page 87 of today's agenda.
Kira Koto, Nicola Sutton is uh, presenting this report on my behalf, and Nicola has done the, the work behind it. Kia ora. Um, just uh, I see on the screen that we've got uh, the recommendation sitting there uh, with uh, recommendation 1A. I'd like to make a correction to that. Um, the, uh, uh, the Kiwi Community Committee needs to be removed from that list um, because they are a residence group and if they can be added to the residence group on the following page and Springfield Township Committee should be added to that list so um, just replace Kiwi uh, with Springfield Township Committee uh, instead. Thank you. Um, so just by way of starting, I want to note that committees of council are discharged as per the Local Government Act requirements at the end of a triennium with the new council deciding on appointments or reappointments for the new triennium. This means that there are currently no committees of council uh, in Selwyn. Uh, community committees of council and so on. In this report, we recommend that five community committees of council be reappointed until the 30th of June 2023 so that they can transition to residence groups or uh, determine if they would like to wind up or take a different path at that period or before if they choose. I just wanted to give a very short uh, background to uh, this. Several years ago, there were over 70 community committees of council existing with various purposes, including operational support for reserves, community halls and pools, and advocating uh, for their communities on issues with council. Um, there have been quite a number of changes in recent years with the roles and responsibilities of committees changing. Um, this included things such as the district district-wide rates for community centres, halls and reserves, online centralised booking system and service level agreements, council taking on operational management of council-owned facilities, standardisation of employment agreements, um, a new community fund to support community projects, a facilities network plan um, and uh, some other things as well. So it made sense that um, many of those committees be discharged as their roles were uh, no longer there um, and for some committees to become independent residence groups. So the number of community committees of council have reduced over time from 70 uh, to this point where there are just five. Um, and um, what I would like to point out um, that the report is primarily um, uh, making the point that residence groups are entirely independent of council and can choose how and what they uh, are involved in and how they like to represent themselves and form, whereas community committees of council are subject in all things to the control of council and as such a limited in their ability to advocate for their community. With regards to the reappointment of the five committees, we put forward four options for you to consider. Um, the first option, which is the preferred option, is that the five committees be reappointed until the 30th of June 2023. And the purpose for that is to allow us to support those committees to determine if they would like to become residence groups or if they would like to take some other form or wind up altogether. Um, noting that if those groups wanted to become residence groups earlier than the 30th of June, that, that would be um, able to be accommodated. So the other options that were made available, two of them were around reappointing resident, uh, the committees of council for a further triennium, with option number two being um, that they wind up at the end of this, um, and option number three leaving it to the next council to make a decision about the direction. And then the last option was um, not not reappointing the five committees at all. Um, there was also a second recommendation in the report, and that is around the extension of the annual residence group fund until the next annual planning period. This annual fund is 24,000 and what it does is provides a small administration grant for recognised residence groups for items such as venue hire and administration expenses with the remainder of the fund available as a small contestable pool for some community projects and of course residence groups are eligible to apply to the council's community fund as well for uh, projects in their community. Um, so that is the background for uh, the document, the report. Okay, thank you uh, for bringing it to us and I think for also highlighting that um, it would be disingenuous of us 
to not reinstate these committees now, uh, having six weeks ago um, closed them uh, as committees of council uh, through our own election period. Uh, there was some discussion about the, the fear within those groups that this meant to be gone forever. Uh, and so now this means there's a, a chance for a discussion about what transition might look like um, over the next uh, six months or so. Um, I think in the report too, it's good to highlight that there's a whole lot of support that continues regardless of that. There's one decision, there's a whole lot of support the Council will continue um, to make available around room hire uh, and contribution to secretarial services, um, which again is a support for, for those groups. And um, thank you for uh, really clearly Appendix 2 on page 98 of the report, uh, sharing what the difference is between being a committee of council and being a community committee or a, a residence group. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of confusion around this where people have felt like because they're not a committee of council, they can't be a committee. And actually, the whole idea here is if you're not a committee of council, we want to free you up to be the best local committee that you can be. Um, and to highlight the couple of things that are there, uh, if they want to say a committee of council, they're in no way independent of council, uh, whereas residence groups are fully independent. Uh, if committees of council can't choose to oppose what council does. Um, residence groups can choose to oppose what council does. Uh, community committees are subject to the control of council. Um, residence groups free themselves from that and are able to organise themselves how they uh, want to. Uh, community committees of council can't apply for funding from us, whereas residence groups can. If they say as committees of council, we would say that they can't, you know, could continue to say they can't run their own separate bank accounts, can't make independent decisions. We would discharge them every three years, creating uncertainty about their future, and they're subject to the control of council at all times. Whereas once they become residence groups, they can do their own funding, they can run their own bank accounts, they can decide how they appoint their representatives, they can invite whoever they like to be a part of those committees. Um, and so there's, there's a whole lot of freedom here that the comms around this over the last two years, I think, has been has been jumbled. Uh, and so for clearly laying that out in the report today, I think is very helpful. So thank you um, for, for bringing that to us today. Are there comments um, or questions that councillors have uh, around this report? Sophie? Yeah, um, I guess so. Uh, thank you very much for the report and for all the work that's gone behind it, ladies, because um, it has been a very long road. <laughs> um, I guess, yes, I would definitely be keen to see um, free meeting room hire continued in the next annual plan because that is, we, we want to encourage public engagement, and this is one of the ways that we can do that um, in terms of the actual cost of it. It's a, a drop in a much wider bucket to be honest um i'm curious about a couple of things one is they mentioned that the remainder of the fund will be available as a contestable pool for community projects undertaken by residents groups in the sense that um if you know a, a lot of people sort of wait until the last minute to apply for any funding to apply back for for instance costs towards anzac parades websites and all that sort of stuff at what point is there a, like are they aware of a cutoff when you have to apply that so that then the total is known and the rest can be opened up uh, and just in terms of the process it's intended to be aligned with the Selwyn community grants fund committee and the process is associated with that so the, it will be a, a ring fenced fund attached to that so the same general process will be applied and um and i guess in terms of communicating what's left and um and, and what's available, that would be part of that would be part of the process. I guess we can't confirm that until such time as we know how many uh, residence groups there are, and it's uh, the onus will be on them registering with us as residence groups. Okay, which leads nicely into my other question, which was um, in terms of the number of residence groups. Um, it's always quite interesting looking at the the list, um, which obviously goes back many many decades of all the different township committees. Um, Rolleston has one residence association and Jens has done a great job of demonstrating today that you know you can come to council and speak at a public forum and everything else. I'm just wondering if at some future date for you know the subdivisions of Rolleston or you know the the the, the, the area south of Dines Road decided that they were going to set up their own one, how do they go about getting added to the list? 
Uh, I guess from our point of view, it would be about uh, regis registering with us. There's some very limited criteria that we put around what constitutes um, a criteria for being a residence group, but we're not putting the the um, the criteria or, 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 or limitations around that. So potentially, yes, there could be a neighbourhood group establish themselves in in, a, in the form of a residence group. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Deborah. Sorry about this, but I'm going to have to find a report somewhere on this agenda that I can actually speak positively. Um, one of my criticisms um, with regards to this particular report is that instead of being on a community committee and actually having to read it on the agenda, it would have been really nice if someone had have actually approached these committees and given them a heads up just with regards to, you know, um, politeness that this was actually on the council agenda for today for discussion. So they, if they chose, could have actually been available at a public forum within um, an allocated time frame to speak to all of us. Um, and that's that's one of my disappointments with regards to, to the process. It's important that we take our communities with us. We don't divide um, our communities um, and I guess um, the issue that that I've slowly seen happening um, over a period of time is we've sort of given mixed messages to many of these communities. We have told them to amalgamate their hall, their reserve and their township committees all into one. Um, in one case they were part of an incorporated society. No, they had to be unwound from the incorporated society. And now I'm going to have to go to a meeting tonight and tell them their best option is going to be re-going back to the incorporated society model that they had previously. Um, I just, I know this is going to go through, but <laughs> volunteerism is a key functioning of what we pride ourselves and so on and um and just with regards to the way that we are addressing the in-house measurements i guess of how we are managing is like the city council model um and it's not a selwyn model um and i just see the erosion um and it's a shame because we are different from Christchurch city council and i would have liked to have seen um that autonomy um, for Selwyn actually remain. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for your comments. I think they were very valid. Um, I just want to raise the point that I do see that there are benefits here that Denise and Carl have outlined in this report um, that will make it more validating for the public to be able to raise concerns with the council. My only concern is long term that we are potentially losing community voice and I want that to be somehow factored in and protected so that it's not that there doesn't become a great divide and it drips away um, and that those community groups become very separate to what we do here in council. Thank you. Thanks, Luba. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the report. I guess um, reflecting, reflecting on the process uh from the time it was introduced um when i reflect on it, the, the purpose of the transition of committees of council uh, in most part was due to complexities over perceived responsibilities and over investment of staff time um the committees of council i was a representative i was felt a, a huge amount of pride and still do in representing their uh, community as volunteers and the close connection they have with council uh, feedback from the committees uh during the process has been discontent, limited communication, confusion at some points, well, sadness. Um, the process, in the opinion of the committees, is quite an unceremonious uh, as of today, uh, and without dignity reflected of the contribution made by the committee members over the last 100 and more years. Um, I feel for those that have struggled with the process, and some of them here today, you can only but thank them uh, for the service of the committees to council. Uh, and community over the last 100 years of service. Some of them uh, here today, uh, you know, 30 years, uh, 50 years, um, 40 years in one committee that uh, I'm a part of. So 
uh, a whakatauki would be whakanuia te tangata ringa roupa. I uh, respect the person with calloused hands and uh, I don't believe that we've shown some of the committees uh, that have serviced our communities uh, a level of respect um, equivalent of their service. Um, I would expect that the uh, residents associations are accessible on the council website. And also I think that um, should this go ahead, depending on that we need to uh, have a party basically or, or something that recognises the service of the committees that have uh, uh, represented us. Um, are we certain, and I think Deborah's raised it, we certain the remaining committees and the res residents um, associations are aware of the decisions today. If they are not, then we need to allow time for them to understand the, the decisions being made. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so upon receipt of this report, I made contact with um, committees in my area um, to discuss their thoughts on this. And um, their, their feedback is that, yeah, they can agree to the recommendation on the terms that residents associations will retain free hires and are provided with assistance to transition to a residence association. And whether that be financial or by staff, it doesn't matter but they just need help to transition. Um, and yeah, I think in six months is, is doable. Um, we need to keep these residents associations empowered um, as these groups are crucial to our communities. Um, and I agree with Shane's sentiment that there's been a lot of hard work going over many, many years uh, that these people have put into our communities. So we do need to thank them for everything they have done for us. Um, I know on page 89, residents groups have free hire of a meeting room. Do you have any idea of what those conditions are that they will qualify for? I don't have off, off hand, but I know that there are some, there is a range of concessions and um, that residents groups are eligible to apply for funding. And so the costs can be met beyond beyond the 30th of June through through that mechanism. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lydia. Oh, sorry, no. uh, Sophie, a long road, um, a long road of strangling community committees slowly. Um, I'm against this. I'll be consistently against this. I, I just can't see. Um, really, I feel we've lost our way. Um, we're heading towards a corporate model where we're an untouchable remote organisation. What is the role of a councillor and what is the role of a community and how do you interact? Um, being an elected member, you must interact with your communities and the best source of information is community committees or residents associations. They give you direct on the ground mm -hmm. feedback straight away um, and some of it you won't like, but that's what you need to hear when you're a councillor is that direct um, conscious feedback. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, um, and I've repeated this, We've been poorly served through this process. Um, this is the clearest report I've seen, um, and it, it gives some direction, but I'm really concerned um, where this is heading. And I think we seem to be committed to killing off volunteerism, as I like to say, but it's, I guess not. But I mean, why would we ask our residents groups to apply for money from the council and give it back to the council for room hire? I mean, Surely you just provide with free room hire. We built the halls and community centres exactly for that reason. So that alone wants some ending. But I propose um, that this report um, lie on the table until March. My rationale for that is, um, as Deborah said, um, and I've had numerous phone calls from community committees or, or residents associations, they haven't even had a chance to read this report, haven't seen it, don't know if it even existed. Um, so I think to be fair to these groups, we should allow them, most of them be on holiday in January, so their first meeting will be February to meet in February, consider this report, give us as councillors constructive feedback to bring to our March meeting, where the report can be uplifted and, and actually worked on. That'll give the staff time to think about room hire, I suppose, as a straight away for a start off in between times. But So I'll um, I'll move that in that direction, as that it lie on the table and uh, be brought back to our March meeting. Uh, I hope for a second. I'll second that. Thanks, Greg. I'll second that. Deborah, you second that. Thanks for um, putting it forward. I think that there's not going to be a debate on this. It's just that if we approve it, there's not actually a committee to meet in January, February or March because the committees don't exist at the moment. 
So I just want to think about what we're actually asking when it's lying on the table. I get, I get what you're requesting, but the mechanism well, I of it. that we produced the trium ending. We did not. We, we consciously did not discharge those committees for that very reason. Uh, they all have to be discharged. And what we said was this wasn't the end of them. We would come back and revisit it at this point, which is trying to give them now a life, which says we, if we were to pass this today. That I would think be as yeah, that, 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 that alone is probably we can agree as a group. That they continue until March. I mean, do we have to go through a whole procedural motion? There's enough goodwill around the table to, to we accept that they continue. Sorry, well, if you want me to move a motion in that direction, that they're it's along the table is what I'm asking. So I can't move. I can't add an addition to that motion. I suppose we've got to vote on that first, Mr. Mayor. It's just if what if you what you want them to do is to continue to exist and be able to meet till March. This report does that because this says they should continue. So. I just think what you're asking is actually the reverse of what this report has actually got, and yet what we need is this report to make it happen. I don't, I don't think that's what this report is. It's a definitive answer about the future of community committees by saying they will end in June 2023, or the alternate options of appointing for the full three-year term with um, with them moving to um, extermination, or being reappointed for a full three-year term and carrying on differently. That's not what I'm suggesting in this line on the table. The opportunity is for those committees to, to consider the paper and report back. Is, is there a lack of goodwill around the table to accept that these committees continue in the meantime? I, I mean, surely we're pragmatic enough to accept that. Uh, David, do you have a comment? Well, I'm, I'm reading a recommendation which says Council reappoints the five community committees until 30th of June. 2023, but I sort of point out this is not the first time this matter has been discussed. And what's this Denise report number 12 or 13 on the subject? So it's it's not new to councillors. Um, we've taken a definitive approach, and each one of those reports, this one and those that preceded it, followed the lines that council had agreed to, not unanimously, I accept, but had agreed to at the time. So I think we're just sort of kicking the can down the road here, or whether if we if we don't adopt these recommendations. Okay, well, rather than rushing into a decision, um, we've got, it's 2.30 now, I said we were going to pause whatever item we were at at 2.30 and take on the water um, discussion with Bill Bayfield online with us. Uh, little, we'll come back to this item straight after um, the uh, chlorination item and then we can figure a way forward through this soon. In the same order? Denise and Nicola, sorry for um, pausing this halfway through. I haven't written down the order, Phil, sorry. Uh, Mr. Who was going to speak next, but actually, if, if we've got a motion that it lay on the table, which will mean there's not going to be further debate on it if that's passed. Uh, so the speaking order won't matter at that point. Uh, thank you. I forget. Bill online. I think Gary and Bill is not going to be available immediately. So is Denise still in the room? Yeah, thanks. Welcome back. It was a very quick coronation discussion. Uh, <laughs> Great. So we'll just continue where we left off. Uh, moved and seconded that this matter lie on the table. It's a procedural motion. There will be no further debate on the matter itself. Um, if passed, um, we're suggesting, Grant, you're suggesting that it come back to a March meeting. And uh, if it's 
fails, we will continue with the debate uh, today. So all those in favour that this lie on the table, please raise your hands. So are we getting, not going to discuss the motion? No. no. Not the it's procedural table. motion around whether it lay on the table. You get to vote about it. So this, the, this vote is whether it lay on the table and come back to us in March. All those in favour, please raise your hands. One, oh. two, three, four, five. Uh, all those against, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's lost. We'll continue to the debates now. Uh, and Bob yeah. and then Phil. It's, it's just really a query, and I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I've been involved with a lot of these committees through this, and I think the majority that have changed to a resident group tells what the community wanted, in, in my area anyway. But the one thing I'm hearing lately is that if it's true that you don't want to see their minutes and such like is really getting up people's nose in a big way to put it mildly. They think that as councils tried to get rid of us, and now they don't even want to hear what we're doing. So I'd really like an answer to that that's definitive. What I'm going to do again is pause the meeting because Bill Bayfield has now joined us. Sorry, Bob, you can restate that next time as if so you think about what your response is. <laughs> Trying to make the most of this 30 minutes uh, that we've got with Bill uh, joining us. Bill, I hope you can hear us. We can see you. You're muted at the moment, Bill. You're going to see if we can. This is the coronation item. It's number 19. It's on page 175 of today's agenda. Bill, can you give us a thumbs up whether you can hear us? Yep, we just can't hear you. Okay, so if you can figure out how to turn your microphone on, it's currently off. How about that? Yeah, that's good. We can hear you now. Okay, and so it's going to be back to 175, tab 19 of today's agenda. Uh, David, report yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. So, no, before you start, we have a fancy line on the table uh, <laughs> that we need to pick up before we start this from our last meeting. Also, move. Yeah, move Malcolm and Shay that the matter be uh, lifted off the table to be discussed today. Um, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Anyone against? Declare it carries. Uh, the reason that was to lay on the table was to allow a report. As discussed at the last meeting, I'll get David to speak to it first. Uh, Bill has joined us online, and then we will look through the recommendations. David. Thanks, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. So, as you quite rightly say, at our meeting on the 14th of December, uh, that was this matter was left to lie on the table to allow staff to prepare a report based on issues that were raised. This is that report. I'm just going to start with the recommendations in that report. The recommendations are that Council continues its programme of temporary residual disinfection until Taumata Arawai is confident each of our schemes can be operated without residual disinfection in a way that's consistent with the main purpose of the Act. Secondly, the Council continues to work with Taumata Arawai to seek exemptions for potable water schemes. And thirdly, we review the process and cost of effecting improvements to the Rakaia Hut scheme that were identified in a report which is attached to today's agenda. So by way of background, we remind ourselves that it was just over 12 months ago, government enacted legislation requiring all potable water schemes to have residual disinfection or chlorination added to them by 15 November 2022. Council debated that on the 11th of May um, in a paper identifying all schemes and the, the assessed risk that they had across the district. Council took the view that we are required to be compliant with legislation and proceeded with disinfection of, to date, uh, 15 of the remaining schemes. There are two more which are scheduled for early disinfection in early 2023. We have continued to maintain dialogue with Talmata Arawai, and in doing so, uh, we acknowledge that they have prepared a program for assessing applications that are coming in from Canterbury Councils. In May 22, we talked about the legal requirements under Section 31 of the Water Services Act, where a drinking water supply includes reticulation, uh, the relevant drinking water safety plan, sorry for those schemes, require the use of residual disinfection 
which means that a drinking water safety plan must mandate and make provision for chlorination unless an exemption has been uh, applied. So as I noted earlier, we have 26 schemes. Each of them have their own risk assessment, and equally there is a wider risk of statutory non-compliance. Uh, when we started out this exercise, nine of our schemes were permanently uh, disinfected. In proceeding with this matters, council rules will need to clearly understand that risk of uh, non-compliance and importantly be clear in your minds as to how we are managing that risk. It's incumbent upon council to satisfy itself that it understands the risk it's prepared to accept a risk if it moves away from the disinfection program and uh, takes on board any health concerns as liability will clearly be for council for non-compliance with the scheme. If council is to proceed to turn off those schemes that are disinfected at the moment, there would be a cost both to decommission and to recommission those schemes, and that cost would include disposal of chlorine out of the system and allow for recommissioning, flushing and ongoing calibration. Now, since we last met in, uh, two weeks ago, staff have been in, as I said, continued discussions with the regulator, Taumata Arawain. I'm going to ask Bill to talk shortly, but in respect to our application for exemption for Rakaia Huts, so Rakaia Huts is a scheme of uh, about 300 connections, one of the smallest ones we've got. We've got the report, which is attached to today's agenda, noted that on the whole, the drinking water supply at Rakaia Huts is well set up and operated. However, it notes there are a number of factors that affect the provision of safe drinking water cons to consumers, and not all of these are adequately addressed in the supply set up, operation, or associated planning. And these matters prevent the supply from being able to operate without residual disinfection slash chlorination in a matter that's consistent with the purpose of the Water Services Act. In the very detailed paper, paragraphs three and four to be specific, uh, concerns were addressed, suitable conditions were imposed, and they consider it likely that it could recommend it, uh, Taumata Arawai consider it likely that they could recommend a decision to grant exemption for residual disinfection for supply if those matters were satisfied, thus the latter of the recommendations. So given the comments from the exemption team, council staff are clearly of the view that firstly, we need to take time to discuss the content of the paper with the authors, and we've initiated our first conversation on Monday afternoon of this week, uh, to assess the process and the cost to address those issues, and to enable us to give council the information it needs to make a sound decision. So there's two matters that we need to talk about. One is perceived inconsistency across um, council, and the second and more important one that I'm going to talk about, and that is the way that we address those issues in Paris 3 and 4, and also other options available for us. As we see it, council has five options. The first of those is to continue with our disinfection program and continue with the application for exemptions. The second one is to, dis is to face disinfection for all schemes until we've had our exemption requests considered. Option three is to cease disinfection for the lowest risk schemes, and of course lowest risk will have to be assessed, whilst at the same time filing for exemption. The fourth option is to review the process and the cost affecting improvements of affecting improvements to require huts to ensure it can be compliant. And the fifth option is to ask council staff and contractors to prepare a program for turning off disinfection, detailing the process and the cost. The favoured option for staff is option one, that is to continue with our disinfection program and apply for exemption. But we need to point out that the legal risk of non-compliance lies with council staff. Section 29 of the Water Services Act imposes a duty on every officer, employee and agent of a drinking water supplier to exercise due diligence to ensure the drinking water supplier complies with legislated duty. 
In other words, we don't set out to break the law. We comply with the law and we make sure that we have a safe water supply for our communities. Concern about the legal exposure has also been expressed by council's, council's contractor on behalf of their staff as a result of their contractual obligations to council. So again, Mr Mayor, I'm just, Bill, I'm going to throw to you, but again, just the recommendations. Uh, firstly, that we continue the program of temporary residual disinfection until Taumata Arawai are regulators confident schemes can be operated without residual disinfection. Con continue to seek exemptions and review the process and cost of effecting improvements to require huts because staff are clearly of the view that the, the report from Taumata Arawai, which starts on page 18 of, 182 of the agenda, is quite specific in terms of the expectations and equally, though, the recommendations in paragraphs three and four uh, for compliance. So, Mr Mayor, that's what all I wanted to say, and I just get some uh, comments from uh, Bill. And Bill, welcome. There are a number of people in the uh, public gallery. And just by way of background, Bill is the Chief Executive of Taumata Arawai. Kia Tato. And first of all, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. And, and I recognise it's a privileged position, so I thank you for that. I'm very pleased that we were able to get the draft decision on Rakaia Huts uh, to your offices. Uh, and I think that that has shown us uh, all uh, just that the application of our legislation is perhaps a little trickier than we'd all envisaged in the process of obtaining an exemption uh, will not be as simple and straightforward as many of you would have liked, indeed, as, as we would have thought. I think that decision clearly sets out a decline and 11 reasons why uh, that is a declined uh, draft decision at the moment. You have, as a council, and it's the, the officers of the council, 10 days to provide feedback on that decision. And, and then Ray, who's sitting beside me, my head of regulatory and ourselves, we have to make that final decision and issue that. It strikes me that with a decline, it's very difficult for you, on based on your officer's recommendation, to turn off that chlorine uh, dosing that you currently have in place, that residual disinfection. Nevertheless, what I would give as an undertaking is that you, whatever you decide, we will work through your applications as quickly and promptly as we can. I think we're going to learn a lot from Akaya. In a matter of a couple of weeks, we'll see CUSC decision released just before Christmas, uh, and that indeed will, will help Waimakariri work out its priorities and what it must do. Um, I'm very interested in the decision you make, um, decisions that, that has to be based on your officers' recommendations, technical information that they've provided, uh, and in a way that will help myself and Ray formulate the final decision that we in turn have to release uh, as soon as possible. Um, I would imagine that your feedback is going to take uh, a few days post this meeting, and I imagine that we might make a final decision, probably given that we're bureaucrats in Wellington, it'll be sometime towards the end of January. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but difficult when really I'm, I'm the decision maker, uh, and now you have my draft decision or our draft decision, and we seek your feedback. Thanks, uh, Bill, for that. And for councillors, there's a notice of motion that's now what we're discussing, and there's also some recommendations from staff which will form part of the discussion. So we'll deal with the um, each of those individual items at the end of this, but right now is a chance to ask Bill and have some discussion around what that um, has looked like, and then we'll get to the, to the decision-making um, after that. So does anyone have any uh, comments or questions that they'd like to um, raise now with uh, Bill and Ray? Thank you for joining us. Okay. Thanks, Bill, for um, the report. Um, and given um, the mention in the report of the intensification, I guess, of agriculture, um, the rise in lifestyle blocks, the rise in septic tanks, um, which was highlighted, which is a drawdown effect with regards to safety of our water supplies, I guess. The issue is how do we and so on are ever, ever going to get past the exemption barrier? The question I want to 
proposed to you is 20, over 20 years ago, we had problems with some of our water supplies. We did have poo from birds actually getting into unsecured supplies and causing contamination. We made a policy that all of our water for our bulls would be a sealed unit. And I'm sorry, I'm really lost. But if you've got a sealed plastic unit, and the story that was told to me was birds could still land on it, the defecation could run down the side of the tank, and if the tank was had a split in it, then it could be actually drawn into the tank. But if the tank had a split in it, then the water would be running out. So, you know, I mean, and this is this is actually what is some of it was written in the paper, and this is how it was explained to me about the security of, of the birds. So I have some real questions about how long you have drawn your bow with regards to um, the safety of our drinking water standards um, for our immunity systems. And, and the other is, my question to you is with regards to chlorination infiltration systems, if people choose to put them at the gate so they actually take out the chlorine before it gets to their household supply, do you have any responsibility in that service delivery from the gate to their drinking tap? Okay, so there's two questions there. And the answer to the first one is relatively easy. And that is, um, Councillor, if those are your thoughts, then I look forward to the receiving that as feedback to influence my decision. Um, but for now, I, I don't think it's appropriate to debate the detail of what you would like to see changed in the report right now. I look forward to your council's collective feedback. Um, with respect to somebody treating water between, if you like, what is this, historically known as the Toby and their tap, um, they can do that. They effectively become a self-supplier. Um, and so that is personal choice, um, a rather expensive and difficult personal choice, but personal choice nevertheless. Thank you. Thank you. Sophie. Yes, Bill, Bill, thank you very much for, for coming back to us. And I'm glad that I'm actually in the room today as opposed to isolating at home. Um, to be honest, I wanted information and we've got information. And it was not exactly a pleasurable read, but it, definitely adds to the picture. So I appreciate very much that we've had it back in time for this discussion. Um, one question I have as a result, I've got a few questions for our staff, but one that I've got for you guys mm -hmm. is, um, so it mentions that leakage um, is an issue for Te Mana Te Wai, uh, which is actually quite good to see where that link comes in. I get it. What is there, is there any impact that you, uh, that your staff have uh, considered around leakage of chlorinated water on to mm. or to white because obviously <laughs> the water can come out as well and the chlorine could impact the soil biota and, and the water table and all that sort of stuff in that sense too. And the other question which um, I was hoping that we would see was uh, obviously this is, as you said, it's uh, a more complicated process than anyone really figured before we started with these exemption applications. Is there any indication of a timeline for the remainder, um, given that there are quite a few that we were hoping to apply for? Um, or is that now in the level of how long is a piece of string? Thanks. Um, again, a couple of questions there. The first one for me is, um, no, I, th I, I actually believe the information that's available to us from this first draft decision um, will actually assist the process and speed it up. Um, mm. I, I doubt very much that it'll speed up the actual realisation of a chlorine-free water supply. I think what it's told us is that the, the test in the modern world is pretty high. Uh, and I think your staff need to yeah. take a really good hard look at those 11 areas that were identified in the report, and they'll provide you with advice as to how quickly you might address those uh, and, and indeed whether or not that makes sense and that's not for me to call if your desire is still to go for chlorine unchlorinated supply 
then those are the things that you have to address. And there is no reason why we can't look at it again. Um, I, I would seriously hope that it would speed the process up. I'm seriously uh, asking that all of these be addressed by November the 15th um, next year. Uh, that's essentially a year later than perhaps we'd anticipated, but it's practical. Um, beyond that, I think we'll be open to um, all of us uh, considerable criticism. Mind yeah. you, the one area that you have almost future-proofed yourself on in terms of any future criticism is that you are chlorinating that supply now. Uh, and that, therefore, would seem to me an incredibly sensible uh, step to take while you consider your options. Uh, lastly, I think there was another question there. Yes, water can leak in and out of any crack. Um, and it is interesting that the loss of any water, whether chlorinated or not, um, is an impact not only on Tamano to Y principles, but it's also an impact on the, the risk to the system. And so on almost all significant drinking water systems, we're likely to have an environmental performance measure that's going to be a target over time where leaks are eliminated or reduced to a minimum. And uh, as I think the report said, Rakaia is regarded as a pretty well-run system. There are some quite horrendous figures in terms of staff, uh, water loss and leakage out of systems throughout New Zealand. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we're going to go over to um, for a meeting without a break. I'm just going to move that we continue this conversation through to its conclusion Second. rather than breaking. Seconded, Deborah. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Anyone against? Declare it carries. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shane. Um, thank you very much for the report. I guess safe drinking water is the question. There are a number of us, a number of those around the room that would um, that say the health of the water uh, is safe, and and the report only points to the risk of incursion or uh, the what ifs. So my question is: There's a five month, two week time frame for turnaround of an exemption report, standard practice. With regards to the visiting doctor from America, do we know what? Uh, do we not have the expertise in this country uh, to assess the health or infrastructure? And where did our did Dr. Dan Deer visit? Who pays? Uh, I would have expected, with respect, more uh, from the 14 page report in this time frame to have come forward. But also note that the report is without any scientific data to determine chlorination is needed and refer to the original intent of installing the necessary infrastructure, page 3.11, permanent standby chlorination is installed and is fully commissioned to be used in an emergency or transgression event, or while SDC seek a chlorine exemption. The report suggests engineering solutions to safeguard against incursion from sorts. However, how likely is an incursion will occur within a sealed unit, uh, that being a pipe without a measure of UV. In fact, it would seem that the investment into UV, according to the report, would be what it seems to have been a waste of money. Um, as you can see, in relation to the report and the connection uh, to the Water Regulatory Authority, there's an integrity issue uh, and um, undermines the original intent of prudent government's decisions and ratepayer investment. Well, I question the one size fits all approach and refute the need for priority two and three schemes to be chlorinated at all unless in the event of a transgression. Kia ora. Um, kia ora. Again, I really thank you for your comments. Um, I don't think that we've taken too long to do the first in New Zealand. Um, and I do expect them to speed up. I expect both sides, and, and I expect Waimakariri and Christchurch and others to learn from your experience. I expect the process to speed up considerably. Um, it, we all want this result um, one way or another and clarity given. Uh, but your comments, the rest of them, they should really form part of your council's feedback to us on the draft decision. Well, thank you. Uh, Lydia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bayfield, for being available uh, to ask questions. Mine's quite brief. Um, uh, in your recent media release after it came to light that one Makerere District Council had other options, you did state that there were, were alternatives that our neighbours have adopted. Why were the alternatives not given to us? They were, and, and your council chose, in my view, very robustly. Uh, Waimakariri, like you, considered the risk. Um, the risk that was reported by their officers to their council uh, allowed them, in their view, to continue with the risk of treating only when there were, were, if you like, issues with the supply. So, in other words, they continued with the same risk that they had prior to our legislation. Um, when the CUSP report comes out, 
I think you're going to see them face the same queries and questions that you're facing. Um, I haven't seen that report yet, so I'm speculating, but I think that the, the options for Waimaka area are, are narrowing and they will be very similar to your options in a very short while. Thank you. Thanks, Lydia. Grant. Hello, Will. Um, really, it's quite a narrow question, a couple of questions, but um, as CEO of Tamata ROI, um, are you issuing a directive to us to continue as we are at the moment and treat our water? That's the first question. Um, if that question is, is no, I suppose the question then, as Lydia suggested, is uh, are you comfortable in, in us offering the same opportunity to pursue the direction that Waimakariri District Council is pursuing? Um, so there's, you've made it clear in your discussions that you did provide that option to us, but we declined. Unfortunately, um, that might not be your fault, but my recollection of our, our papers to us was that we were told um, by the 15th of November we must have our supplies temporarily chlorinated under threat of prosecution. So um, perhaps you could make it easy by um, telling us you're issuing a directive bill, which would make it very simple. <laughs> if not, um, what are the options? It would make it very simple, um, but I'm the decision maker with a draft decision. I need feedback from your council, and that includes clearly making the decision you're going to make today. And then I have to consider carefully what options I have. And the position that you're, you're debating today makes my decision quite difficult. And, and indeed, for the, first, for the first decision to be released under this new regime, I'm going to have to consider my options quite carefully. For you to turn off the chlorination that you currently have in place on a water supply in which you've received a decline and there are 11 areas that you have to address, um, that's, that's, that's something that I'm going to have to take advice on. I wish I could issue a deck directive. The directive will probably come in the form of the decision. Understood. And um, I, so currently the Rakai Huts is chlorinated as we today? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Actually, that's a good point because I believe at the time that the, um, the time the inspection was made, it wasn't. Um, was, my, my query is that my understanding was that it was unchlorinated wait, awaiting the exemption decision. So um, has it been turned on in the interim? All right. That's our understanding. Uh, that's the understanding of our inspectors. All right. Uh, to see you here, I suppose we're confirming in the room that it has been turned on. Yeah. Okay. Just repeat the question, Grant. Okay. Rakai Hats are turned on. It's, it's turned on, Murray. Rakai Hats has chlorine on. In the system. only ones that haven't got chlorination are down the road in Brimbleton. We've stuck to the program we had back in May, and it's regardless of the application of the exemption application. It was a program uh, that was designed basically to allow. Uh, us to do chlorination in a reasonable process, working with our contract to be able to do it in a reasonable time. That's the whole reason. Uh, next speaker is Elizabeth. Hi, Bill. Do you have evidence that chlorine is perfectly acceptable for long term use for human health? Because I used to work, work in a water testing lab and we tested our water on rats. And it was a once-off test on the rats to see whether that water was safe or not. And it didn't have the cumulative effects of long-term use. Now, water is, is massively um, important to not just human health, but also the well-being of our, our agriculture and horticulture industry, as well as the aquatic life. And as Sophie mentioned before, if the water is being used in, in other ways or escaping in other ways, then it has a, an ongoing environmental effect. So I'm just wanting to know whether you guys have really done the due diligence on this and whether you can now point us into your case test studies to show and prove that these areas have been thoroughly investigated, um, preferably in the New Zealand setting, uh, with a long-term study to show that these are safe and not harmful for human and in the line. Um, we're satisfied that that work has been done. It's been done by the Ministry of Health and access to World Health Standards and Investigations. That's not our role as the regulator. As the regulator, health basically do that research for us. They advise us. Um, they set policies in effect. 
and we make the regime work. Thanks, Bill. Are there further um, comments or questions people would like to make? To Bill? Bill? He'll continue. Yep. Uh, there's nothing further in the room, Bill. Uh, we'll now work our way through the decision making uh, that we need to make today. Uh, so, Councillor says the matter that we've picked up off the table adds three um, an A, B, and a C uh, to it. Firstly, that we would pause our temporary chlorination of water supplies that were not previously chlorinated as per the Cell and District Council approved uh, water risk matrix. Then we have um, at risk supplies such as River Gallop as river and gallery uh, source supplies will continue to be coronated and C being Sound District Council will continue its program of infrastructure upgrades to accommodate chlorination infrastructure and its network and will work with Tomata Arawai on exemption applications for our unchlorinated network. Uh, the report that we've got today has um, a set of other recommendations for us. Um, the first is that we receive the report, um, which we need to do anyway. The second B is in conflict with the A that was in the notice of motion last time. So the notice of motion suggests that we stop temporary residual disinfection and this says that we would continue with it. Uh, and C and D in today's report um, from the Chief Executive uh, expands on the recommendations that um, Grant and Sophie put forward last time. So I'm going to suggest that we take each of those items separately um, because if A um, and the notice of motion passes, then we don't need to vote on B in today's recommendation. If A and the notice of motion fails, then we have B in today's um, paper that we continue um, the program, which will then provide clarity. Uh, C and D um, expand on the work that was on the notice of motion previously. Uh, if you're happy that that be the case, we'll work that way. If you'd like to, uh, I, just, I don't want to vote on the notice of motion B and C, which if we vote no to, we're then going to put something forward, which basically says the same thing again. So if we have to work through the process, we can, but I just think we can certainly navigate B and C. Um, are, are the mover and seconder of the notice of motion happy with that as the process? Personally, no. Um, you know, a notice of motion has been looked off the table. Mm. It should be voted on first as a procedural motion, mm. and then if there's other other um, motions that come subsequent to that, yeah. that should be the way it proceeds. Um, I feel it's important. Uh, it may be defeated, but I think it's important that we debate notice of motion on uh, a contextual basis and then vote on the notice of motion. I, I may, and again, I'm not holding my seconder to her position. If she uh, wishes to vacate, I'm perfectly happy for that to happen, and there may be another seconder who would step into the gap. But I think it's important that we do debate the notice of motion and then move on to the proposed staff paper. Well, if if councillor uh, wants to go that direction, then that's fine. We'll just work our way through each of them. And if the seconder uh, or the mover uh, want to change from their position, we, it's not a position where you must vote and support on what's put forward. Um, we can, it has already been supported. It was already moved and seconded. It is in front of us because that's the process that we've got to. So we can't accept a removal of something that's already been moved and approved last time. Um, but you'll make your own decision today based on the information we've now got in front of us. So the notice of motion um, A, B, and C uh, are up in front of us. Yes, thank you. Uh, they are there. And we will now have any comments, questions, or debate on this item. Grant, did you have anything more you wanted to say as the mover of this? I would allow the other councillors to um, speak first, and I'll sum up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first up, Sophie. Okay, we seconded the motion, notice of motion. Um, we've since had a whole bunch more information that has come through. Um, and I have read and reread it many times. Um, and I put it this way if we were putting that notice of motion in today, I would not be seconding it. Um, so I still think it's a very important topic that we actually have a debate and that we uh, vote, make a vote on this. Uh, but in contrast to the fact that I signed a piece of paper several weeks ago, um, I will be voting against this notice of motion. Um, I don't believe that we have the evidence to support it anymore. Um, we have a lot more information. There's a wider context available to us. I still have plenty of questions for staff, um, but I'm no longer comfortable with the idea of, remo of removing chlorination from our supplies based on 
the um, imminent uh, decline of the Rakaia Huts exemption. Thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, Deborah. Um, I just want to highlight that I want to add a part B. If we accept this as part A, I'm trying to, what I tried to put my hand up and saying is that I want to submit a part B to this debate. Do you want to hear what part B is now? It'll or, be an amendment to the notice of motion. It'll, it's going to be an amendment to the notice of motion by actually putting in a part B. I'd need to hear it and then receive a second for it to be debated. Okay. So if you want to tell us what it is. Yes. This is a part B, whichever way it goes. Okay. So it's a part D. If it's going to be a part of this report. That, yeah. That staff request that that staff that is that a staff report be written for councillors to assess the costs of securing all our public water supplies to meet Taumata ROI expectations for exemptions to be approved. And B, the cost of providing chlorine filters at private property boundaries connected to our public water supplies. And C, the option... Yeah, Deborah, um, the, hang on. Yeah, you've got to write them down. No, it's yeah. going to be too hard to try and... Um, but out, option C okay. is both the option of a rebate system for those ratepayers who wish to install these coronation filters um, at their gates. So... Okay, thank you for raising that. If you've got that written down, if you yeah. give it to the staff so they can put it in front of us, you know, it may be that that needs to form part of a future report for proper consideration well, rather than voting um, off the cuff on that information today. Um, so we'll continue with the debate that we had, then we'll have that up in front of us and seek a seconder at that point um, if we want to move in that direction. The next speaker, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Adam? Um, only to say that basically reading the report that's come back with regards to um, Rakaia Huts, um, and I said it earlier on, with regards to Springston being next off the list, um, it's already been pointed out that there's a water leakage issue. Um, it should be a really secure supply because um, it's fenced. Um, it's... The only thing that's not encased in, I guess, is a, is a house building, so the birds can't get in there. Sorry for being pedantic, but that's what I'm reading coming out of this report, is, is how far do we have to go and at what cost to try and ex have an exemption for any of our schemes mm -hmm. that we have, um, being first off the rank and um, showing some understanding for the rest of the councils throughout New Zealand that have unchlorinated water, how do we actually get back to not having to chlorinate our water? How do we get back to having an outcome of improving our environment that doesn't require us to pollute up to a certain level? Because she'll be right, I will just chlorinate everything. That is not a good outcome for the environment. And I want to just highlight that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deborah. And the matters that you've raised. Um, that you seek amendment to the motion for. I agree, they're things that are extra to what today's report um, has in it, and I'll get David to comment on how those things might fit in to any future report, because uh, for both for both outcomes, it's an extra set of information that's going to be required. Uh, Phil? Um, yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity to have this debate. Um, I'm not, I am anti-chlorine, I don't want chlorine in our world. I just want to clarify that, because at our, at our last meeting, I was challenged by members of the public and members around this, this table, why did I support chlorine? And I don't. We need to have evidence-based decision-making. And we've now got a lot of evidence in front of us, but um, we, know how, we know what the public feeling is. The public don't want chlorine. Uh, we know that they don't want it because um, during the, the election, well, look at the, the our emails are full of um, 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 Information about a uh, the signing of a petition uh, during the election process that became the issue. Um, we also had people during the election process who said that they wanted to they supported um, public disorder and and things you know to uh, to aggressively and illegally fight chlorine in our water. Now those people are not at this table because our community as a whole didn't want those people at our, at, at, at our table. 
there's a misunderstanding that the community has that this is our that this is our decision. Grant, you said uh, twice today that this is a st storm in a teacup. This is the storm in a teacup. This is a storm in someone else's cup. And if we put ourselves between the central government who are making the decisions through to Mata Arawai and, and the community desire, then that is where the misunderstanding comes, is that the, 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 the public is seeing us as the decision makers around us. We've got no control over this. The, it's it's Tamata Arawai and, and, and the government that are saying, disinfect your water and use coronation. Um, so where to from here? So if we place ourselves inside that line, then the community will say, we should be fighting this at every step we can, but we cannot fight it if the public see us as the people that are, are, are involved. We should be fighting it ourselves. This motion I'll be voting against because, not because I'm, 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 I'm anti chlorination I'll make that very clear right now, but because there is a there is a process here, and at law, I don't think that we have the right to do that. We do we do not have the right to tell our staff employees, our um, the council employees, to break the law. And if if we think we do, then we are the rogues. We're the ones who, who are who are big. and the community doesn't want us to be rogues because if we're going to be rogues on this point here, we'll be rogues on, on, on every point. The count the our communities decided that they did not want the people who are going to be rogues sitting around this table. Um so uh, if passed, I oh, said so no, to um Gave an inconsistent messaging to WiMAC and to and to and to, and to Christchurch. If they had not given out that inconsistent messaging, then they wouldn't be here. So we sought clarification from them, and we've now got that clarification in paragraphs three and four, which has clearly stated what the what the what the criteria is for us to to remove the chlorine from our water. Um, I'll leave it at, at, at that. I've got a few more notes, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, just want to address that last uh, comment you had about uh, Wymac Ariri. Um, so I've been in discussions with what's been going over in Wymac. So they um, approached it differently. So it's not necessarily that TA, Tomato Arawa, sorry, um, had a different approach with them. It's that they had a different approach with Tomato Arawa and they engaged with them early on and they said, how can we make this work? Now they were prepared to make the risk, to take the risk on board as a council, it's because the risk hasn't changed. The risk hasn't changed from before the week, before we started coordinating to what it is today. Our water is as safe as it was last month, as it is this month. So nothing has changed. And that's where they were prepared to take that risk because they have been doing their due diligence. They water test regularly. They have been keeping on top of all their water supplies and maintaining them the best they can and progressing with things in a way which is stated in their in their plans. Um, I want to draw, um, read a few things out today. This is an incredibly important decision that we, the team of councillors, are going to be making today, which will have long-lasting, far-reaching consequences to the people of Selwyn. I want to acknowledge the effort the team has put into this topic, and I want to thank the public who have put in the time and effort to submit. It is not as clear-cut decision as one would hope. This is a case of benefits versus risk. I hope that we can add... Uh, quantify the health and well-being outcomes of our communities. And I have 25 responses of concern, and this is not an extensive report, it's just a number that I've collected from the public, and I'll just share a few highlighted examples with you now. I am a user of continuous positive airway pressure machine that I have to use every night for sleep apnea. It is a water chamber that needs to be cleaned and filled on a daily basis. Before chlorination was introduced, my apnea, hypernea, index readings were low. My CPAP machine now smells of chlorine and my AHI, re AHI readings are high. I use filtered water from the fridge or I can buy bottled water, which means more plastic into our environmental waste. It is important that I have low AHI readings as the readings are sent to a sleep centre and could be sent to Wakakatahi, New Zealand Transport Agency which is not good because it can revoke my driver's license. I am a truck driver. 
I hope that chlorine is taken out of our water supply ASAP. My family is suffering from skin disorder, disorders as a result, and as an expat from South Africa, it really is disappointing that a first world country follows the same cheap and nasty disinfection methods. I am an 82 year old ratepayer from Leeston and I use a CPAP machine at night for sleep apnea. The chlorinated water has a volatile order, odor which keeps me awake at night. And it also creates a similar effect to asthma and making my breathing more difficult. So now I need to buy bottled water just to safely use my machine. I already pay for water in my rates, but then you have to buy bottled water on top of that. On May the 18th, 2022, you said that chlorination would be temporary. If so, when is this to happen? I'm not sure the date the chlorine was added, but by June 2022, my body was suffering. I wrote to the council about the problem. I was given information on how to avoid irritation, none of which worked. Eventually, in July 2022, I brought a filter system to be attached to my house so that no chlorine would enter my property. I went to my GP and was prescribed cetamacrol and have been using it ever since. Morning and night, I apply it to my body. And at 2 or 3 a.m., I have to apply it again. In July, I brought a filter to my house where my water enters. I no longer smell or taste the chlorine, but I am still itching. My cost so far has been, with doctor's visits and medication, a total of over $1,000. I noted that the chemical sodium hypochlorate has been used for less water chlorination. This chemical is the main ingredient in Janola and has been widely used in cleaning products since the 90s. I used to build fiberglass tanks and pipes to store it because it corroded stainless steel. Available free chlorine is 4% when new. This explains why I'm not smelling it, but the water is slimy and bitter. The chlorine is more tightly bonded to the water molecule than other sources of chlorine, so we are effectively drinking bleach albeit dilute. There are a large number of studies done internationally that have shown health implications directly attributed to drinking chlorinated water. However, while we call this drinking water, people also bathe in it, and the skin is the biggest organ, organ and absorbs a considerable amount of minerals and additives that are found in water. There's a list of some of the um, things that have developed from chlorine in these um, Studies, asthma, developed food allergies, excessive sensitive skin, mouth ulcers, acute rheumatic pains, yellow shriveled dry skin, impotence, continuous dry cough. That's only a number of them. I haven't written the full list. DBPs, disinfection byproducts, are considered to be highly toxic. This is created when chlorine reacts to organic matter and releases toxins. Byproducts formed are trihalomethanines and haloacetic acids. These are only created via chlorinated water. Trihalomethanines are group B carcinogenic and have shown to cause cancer in lab animals. DBPs have um, been linked to reproductive problems in both animals and humans. Studies found lifetime cons consumption can more than double the risk of bladder and rectal cancers. A Taiwanese study whose mother drank, whose mothers drank chlorinated water during pregnancy, this was on 40,000 women, were more likely to present with congenital abnormalities, teeth pallets, ventricular septal defects, lack of brain development, and holes in the heart. Chlorine water inhibits uptake of iodine, which is required by the thyroid gland in every cell of the body. The references to these studies are available from me if required. Elizabeth, I just want to, it's great that you're bringing this community views to us. At the moment, we're trying to discuss what our views are around the table. Um, how many more do you have that you're wanting to let us know about? Another minute. Sorry? Another minute. Okay. Perhaps we should consider a more rounded approach and look to Europe where the Czech Republic is one of the most recent countries to start to start transitioning to a chlorine-free water supply, adopting the German strategy, which is similar to the Netherlands and based on four tenants. Knowledge of all water quality source risks and protection of the catchment. Multi-barrier treatment approach to produce by stable potable water. A well-managed and monitored network monitoring surveillance from sorts of tap. Addressing the area of risk to staff, the situation here is exactly the same risk as before, and with regular monitoring in place and chlorination available on standby, we're in a very low, low risk situation, which is what the YMAC has done. The many people from the community that have spoken to me on the subject have felt the health risk to the public is a greater concern from chlorinated water than the potential chance of a water contaminant. But adding chlorine turns it into a real risk community, health risk for the community. On this basis, basis, the decision we are making today is focused on the health implications of our community rather than a legal matter. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Elizabeth. Uh, Lydia. Thanks, Sam. Um, 
And the last long term plan consultation, people told us they wanted their water to remain chlorine free. And I feel it's up to us to provide an option. Up until a few weeks ago, we thought there was no other option than to coronate. Tamoto LOI said in their recent media release that there are alternatives that our neighbours have adopted. I suggest we follow along the same lines while our exemptions are being processed. The notion that interest dies out from people is not accurate, and I feel it's contributing to the general distaste of council. The risk of some of the supplies is relatively low on the basis of the past five years of water testing. Some of the suppliers have had minimal events of coliforms present and supplies have moved from priority three to priority two based on an increased population, not an increase in the risk of coliforms or water quality. With rigorous testing, I feel we can limit the risk to staff while exemptions are processed. We're in a far better position to deliver safe water than Wymac District Council. I know that residents would prefer a boil water notice or temporary dose of chlorine while an event is managed. If we adopt a strict testing policy along the lines of what will have to happen once exemptions are granted, I'm confident we can deliver safe water. I feel potentially aligning ourselves with our neighbours looking into the future Christchurch and Waimakariri, this would put Selwyn in a good position if three waters goes ahead to band together to maintain the wishes of our constituents to supply them with chlorine free water. There is a financial cost and ratepayers said they would pay more to avoid coronation. I find it unnecessary to flush systems after coronation has ceased and this wastage would be inconsistent with Timana or to white statements. I have to ask, are the costs with temporary chlorination always so costly? Does it cost this much every time there is an event? The chlorine can be used in our other permanently chlorinated schemes at a cost of $17,000 per exemption application and to remedy issues with suppliers, there will be substantial costs going forward. With the Rakai Hearts exemption, it seems like it is on the basis of being the first exemption in the country to be processed and an extremely high benchmark has been set for us and a heavy hand applied. Many of these points made in the paper can be rectified by Selwyn District Council. I see there being no major implications to gaining an exemption, but it will come at a cost. We as a council sit in a hard place between central government, Tom Moto ROI legislation and our residents' wishes. And half of this battle should be with central government and Tom Moto ROI. And at the end of the day, I think why I'm here, and that is to represent the views of our constituents. And I believe that they wish for chlorine free water. Thanks, Lydia. Yeah. Well, a number of strong views, obviously, about to coronate or, or not. But the reality is, is that things have changed. There's now legislation in that says that there is a responsibility to be giving water to our residents that is fit to drink all the time. That risk of anything anything happens in that water supply, risk doesn't lie with us, it lies with staff and contractors. And I think that's a very difficult thing as much as we'd like to continue having non-chlorinated water. I think it's very difficult to say that our staff have to wear, wear that cost. There, we don't have perfect systems. This has been shown with the require huts exemption that we've applied for. There are a number of things that we can look at to change. There's going to be costs to that. And as Lily's brought up, our community says they're happy to pay to have water that can be not <clears throat> have no chlorination in it. But there is has to make sure that those systems are in place before we start taking the chlorine out. If we want to be legally compliant with what is in that legislation now. Um, and as Bill Bayfield has said, the test in this modern era is really high and it needs to be high. This is really serious. If we look, 
Hablock North is an example. Many people got sick. Some people died. We do not want that happening in our community at all. Our, all of our system networks aren't totally secure. We take Rolleston, for example. There are a number of cuts that are into our water pipe systems regularly as we've got all these new houses being built. That is a risk, for example. There's also, as what's raised in that require report, is about the backflow preventers. Do we know that those are all working? We can't guarantee that from what was put in that report. And also the other thing that Bill Bayfield has said is it's incredibly sensible to be coordinating the schemes in the meantime. And I concur that's what we, we should be doing. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Shane? Uh, Chairman Nicole, I, sh I should salute. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I guess um, uh, as a citizen, or as a person, I have an opinion. And then there is the, um, the responsibility as a governor that sits around the table to protect uh, the people that live in the district. Um, I see clarity on the, on the meaning of temporary schemes and temporary chlorination. chlorination. Uh, in the priority two and three schemes, it's with seen and uh, strong comments from the constituents that it's not a temporary, it's a, it's permanent and it seems to be coming through quite strongly um, with negative reports right here and skin reactions and smell and taste and so forth, especially in Southbridge, at least in Ellesmere. Um, also, the unintended consequences that businesses are facing and the increased costs to put in filters to protect um, mostly from the taste really of the tea and, and food. One can only assume that all the costs are costs are within associated rural businesses that uh, serve food for uh, public. Uh, this affects livelihoods. A question to the staff really is, um, and forgive me if I already, sure, already know this was council compelled to choose require over say Springston or Leaston, which are newer schemes. Uh, whereas the Manafino of your statement is also another good reason why we need our partners in the room to have their opinions heard. Look, uh, given the level of risk, and we've heard the level of risk uh, and the position that I hold as a governor, I feel uh, that it is the prudent and uh, right thing to do to choose option one, to continue with um, uh, what we have set in motion and have put in place so that council maintains its integrity in its decision-making processes. But I do urge staff uh, to give me surety, yes, I give you mine uh, and your expertise, uh, and also safety from you know prosecution or persecution. That you'll work towards the original intent, which was page three point eleven, that and that all, all permanent coordination is a last resort for the lower priority schemes. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. And all the questions that have been raised, we get David to comment on um, other stuff that need to um, come for those things, Crown. Um, well, thank you everyone for your concerned comments. Um, it's a difficult situation to, to, to discuss. I think the key thing that um, I want to raise is, is the clear, um, as Phil talked about, the clear things that are in front of us. Number one is there's an overwhelming clear um, ratepayer and customer preference to have non chlorinated water. Number two, it's not disputed that legislation is requiring residual disinfection. The gap between the two is Tamata ROI and its approach. Uh, Tamata ROI has, for one better word, been building the plane as it's flying it. It's provided inconsistent advice between territorial authorities. Um, I asked a clear question of the chief executive and gave him the opportunity, is he providing a directive to us to coronate? He would not take up the opportunity. Um, so disappointment in Tamata ROI, um, particularly um, if they'd been clearer um, and earlier, I asked the chief executive some months ago to write to Bill Bayfield and ask him directly on the pathways to non chlorinated water supplies, what exactly needs to be done? What were they looking for? To my knowledge, we didn't have a definitive reply. And so we've, for a bit of word, our staff have been beavering along trying to anticipate what might come out of the um, report. I guess let's focus on particularly on the Mackay Huts for a start because it's two distinct issues here. One is 
Uh, we're pausing coronation on the temporary supplies, but also discussing the coronation decision. Let's discuss the, the draft uh, decline exemption application. I guess if you were cynical and probably I'm a little bit cynical on this, you, it was if laid down in that they would come back as decline because this is the first one in New Zealand. Um, Tomato ROI acting out of an abundance of caution would of course decline um, because it, it would leave them with nowhere else to go. I guess uh, like Deborah, I was concerned um, by the bows they were drawing, uh, particularly about birds, uh, <laughs> but also um, the expense, extents of protection of source water. The notion that they talked about of worrying about livestock, agricultural livestock affecting the source water protection zone, that has huge implications for Selwyn and all the agricultural community in New Zealand because currently um, the exclusion zones around drinking water wells range from as little as five metres in South Bridge to up to 20 to 30 metres. If there is a new emphasis from Tamata Alawai that exclusion zones could be huger, uh, that they have really opened up a can of worms which um, could affect agriculture in New Zealand. I think what I'm concerned about also, um, and I know Tomas ROI is not um, a three waters entity, but what I am concerned about is the ability of local communities' concerns to be heard and passed up the value chain and actually be applied because here's a local community really, really saying to its representatives, we don't want this. And here's a centralised authority telling us, well, we don't care what you say, this is what you'll have. And Lydia has been talking quite eloquently about risk and about our anticipation of risk. And the way the Cell and District Council set itself up to manage risk was, in my view, exemplary. Uh, we set up our water testing, our water plants. We, post the earthquake, installed um, emergency chlorination equipment, which is now being used. Now being used. Uh, we looked at a UV treatment, which has been installed uh, by Tanata ROI's own admission. Our testing frequency was more than legislative required. And so if there is um, a pause in coronation, and the words that um, Bill Bayfield used in the Act, exercise due diligence, regular testing, all water notices if required, emergency coronation, a last resort of tankering if required, I would regard that as exercising due diligence by our staff and by the council. That's the way I would regard it. We're successfully, when you, when you think about risk, you obviously look forward and, and look at your risk factors, but you also look back and tell you what history tells you about the supplies and the risks you faced in the past. Let's hold our hand up and say we have had excursions in the past and Deborah acknowledged those. But what have we done about those? We've identified the risks, we've dr drilled new deep water source bores where required, installed additional filtration. I think our, the feedback I'm hearing from our communities is that they would rather uh, endure or have a boil water notice on a semi-regular basis than have um, coronation in their water. I suppose on a bigger picture, a macro scale, I think it's a sad day, not just for Selwyn, but for New Zealand, when we, we align ourselves um, with our aspirations for water when it, our aspiration is to have colonized water. And I think um, I think there might be Lydia brought up again about Tamana Otawai. And we don't have real clarity around Tamana Otawai. What is Tamana Otawai if it talks about the health of water? Is the Tamana Otawai uh, recommending that our water should be treated before consumption or is otherwise? And I think that's for Tamata Arawai to investigate further with our EU partners and the wider New Zealand as to what they see a water treatment being. The cost um, will inevitably fall to Entity 4 if we proceed, and it appears the government is going to proceed with three waters reform. My, one of my concerns in raising this issue has been that if Selwyn entity, in, goes into Entity 4 as a fully chlorinated um, supply network, Entity um, 4, which is, covers the whole of the South Island, would say, job done. Uh, Selwyn, we don't need to go there anymore. They're fully chlorinated. Let's, let's just leave that alone. Um, I think if we go into Entity 4, uh, much like Christchurch and Waimakariri, with a position that uh, we don't want to be chlorinated and um, we're still in the, going through the exemption process, I think we're better placed to actually uh, require Entity 4 to continue with our exemption applications. So, you know, if my motion fails today, and by reading the tea leaves, I think it's probably going to fail, um, and I've got to accept that. My sincere wish is that um, 
some of those points are taken forward. You know, the performance of Tamata ROI must be questioned. Um, the, the lack of, of, the, of actually defined um, processes for the territorial authorities to follow. The Tamata Otawai um, approach to water, what is the preferred approach? And our entry into Entity D, what is the approach um, and how do we signal to Entity D that this is the preferred option for uh, our supply? So those are the key issues that I'm, I'm bringing today. I think um, I think it's probably appropriate that we vote on it, Sam, and, and move forward. Otherwise, we could be here for quite a long time. Thanks, Grant, for that. Um, David, did you want to share anything, with Murray, if there's anything that David misses? Yeah, just a couple of observations around the table and speaking last. I'm probably repeating a lot of things that everybody's said previously, but I'd, I'd take myself back to 2016. Havelock North was considered safe until it wasn't. And this is where this snowball actually started rolling. Um, commentators have, have acknowledged that people don't want it, but it is the law. It's not our law, but it is national law. And I wonder about some of the personal issues that are being raised at the council table. And I wonder, these are issues that are conceived in Wellington by health officials, adopted into law by government. It is not our law. And I wonder how often some of these concerns are directed back at back at Wellington. We're not, we're not at the start of the queue. Over 80% of the country is already chlorinated. And neighbours to the south, Ashburton, fully chlorinated. Christchurch, correct me if I'm wrong, Murray, about 80%, I think. Yeah. It's just chlorinated, so it's, it's not a new thing that, that we're dealing with here. Council did consider the options that were available to it. It did that at a meeting on the 11th of May, and it resolved by a majority to proceed on the basis that was put forward, and that has been enacted thus far. I want to talk about the risk, the risk of, of voting for the notice of motion. And I need to just set this out, that if we do that, we acknowledge that we are actually acting against the law, and we don't do that. I will be required to deal with staff who have concerns about their personal legal exposure. I've talked about Section 29 of the Water Services Act um, and their exposure if there is a system this act. You, you can't contract out of that risk. You can't say, oh, but we'll look after you. That doesn't happen. We would need to give advice to our contractors and our contractors who do this work, the turning off and, and, and the dosing of the systems. They would need to, to consider their position and probably take legal advice, and there is a significant cost to do that. What I would say is that we can look to address the issues identified in paragraph three and in paragraph four, and we will. Not we should. We will. And that was the point of the meeting that we had on Monday this week. But we need to do that while we are legally compliant. We need to allow staff who are not feeling exposed to be able to do that. Sam. Thanks. Murray, is there anything else, Matt? Only a few comments. Um, really good discussion, actually. Really good points raised. Um, and I'll just make a couple of points from May before we're meeting today. And Grant mentioned this, and we must make the approach we took was correct at the time. In my view, uh, what we've seen from Camera and in the draft decision is very helpful. We know now we know what the ground rules are. I believe they're coming from a point of view that no risk is acceptable. That's a very um, um and, we, and to say to turn that out why they didn't write the policy, they didn't write the legislation, they uh, just to regulate it. And I believe actually the, uh, the way the legislation has been written was a year too early. The decision should have been 2023, not 2022. Um, I have a slightly different view on where the water entities might take this. It's a 20 councils in the South Island and 17 of them are chlorinated. They're hardly likely to try to avoid chlorination. Those other three schemes, they're liable to just say, what would it chlorinate? Because that's what the others do. Um, one of the things in the 2131 LTP, we did, did get a clear message from, from the um, public that they uh, would prefer not to have chlorinated water. At that stage, we asked her having an international study similar to what Christchurch did. We 
estimated it would cost $30 million. That was three years ago. We probably think it's double that now. Um, and I think that's been shown by what Tamata Arawai have come out with their draft decision. They've indicated that the cost that we were looking at is probably um, significant. The um, issues about um, um, unsured communities, in particular, and agricultural land use, were probably a bit of a surprise for us. But we have to acknowledge that, and they will make any future application very difficult. But we think we have to go through, and we what staff plan is to get get all this up, go back, and respond back to the um, to Matt Arroway, and then come back to you with costs of how we would go forward, and that will set the same for future applications. One thing Bill did say about us being you know, at the front of the queue, we've got a clear message from to our Arroway staff that there's no point in dropping in submissions until we really understand the impact of the Rakai output. So I know the pressure is on there to drop an application, but they'll be fraught with difficulty, and it'll be a waste of time until we're sorted the first one out. Cool, thanks, mate. So I'm not hearing from anyone around the table that any of us individually particularly want to see chlorine in our supplies. We hear the community's voice and we don't want chlorine in Selwyn District Council's water supplies. Uh, we are matching that with the legislation and the draft report that we've got. And so we need to understand what the cost is going to be to allow us to get to a place where we can remove the chlorine and meet community expectation where they've told us they're actually willing to pay more to keep that chlorine out. Um, last week, uh, two weeks ago now, there was a report that indicated about a quarter of a million dollars might be required to turn chlorine on and off. Um, I don't think it's the amount of money at Petters. It's more about spending that money on a process that is is process on and off rather than investing that quarter of a million dollars in improvements to the scheme, which might allow us to turn uh, chlorine off permanently. Uh, Shane, you raised what is permanent or temporary mean. Temporary means we intend to apply for exemptions. Uh, and just because we get a, a no or a draft no at the moment doesn't mean that there's any change in direction about wanting to get all the rest of those supplies up to an exemption standard. Mm -hmm. We just need to understand what the process is going to be, what yeah. the costs are going to look like, and that forms the basis of the report that would come back to us. Okay. Um, I think that it's a really clear direction from our community and our One Water strategy that we are building at the moment, which is our directive to the new entity for or, or whoever else takes over mm -hmm. our Southern District Council supplies really clearly understands that we don't want going in our system uh, and the current legislation allows for uh, individual communities to advocate for an extra level of service uh, and to be able to pay extra for that extra level of service and that has been part of the discussion right from the very beginning uh, around the legislation for um, Three Waters. Uh, so thank you Grant for bringing this forward to us today and thank you councillors for all the discussion we've had on it. Uh, Deborah, we'll, if you, yeah. we'll work through DE and F once we deal with the notice of motion because it fits in they, they, they follow on from either way, but they are pertinent to, you know, how do we manage the fact that we don't want chlorine in our water supply? So we'll talk right to that. down to the rebate system. If people are prepared to pay for that extra cost, how can we contribute to actually help them achieve um, that compliance cost okay. for them? because it stops at the gate, and we heard that today at the Toby Box. So if the notice of motion fails, we'll then vote on the report that's on okay. the paper. Potential for something more about that. Uh, and it's a cumbersome one. Are we allowed to vote to break the law? <laughs> is it advisable to break the law? Is that what you're asking? The answer is not. I'm saying is are we allowed to have a motion to break that? As a council, I think we're elected to a space where we uphold the laws of New Zealand. That's what our vote said uh, about a month ago. Um, I've, so are we allowed to vote on a motion that, if upheld, would be breaching the, the legislations of, of New Zealand? So that's a decision that each council is going to make now, uh, and that is going to be a piece that... Um, there will be some discussion afterwards depending on the outcome of the vote, but the advice that uh, was given to us and the oath that we all took six weeks ago uh, said that we would work within the laws of New Zealand. Bill has said that there has been multiple ways in which that has been understood, so I don't think it's as black and white as uh, break and not break. Yeah, great.
Uh, so notice motion A, B, and C that's there in front of us. All those, uh, which is that we pause temporary coronation on our supplies. Um, B and C. All those in favour say, I'll raise your hands. One, One two, two, three. All those against, please raise your hands. Um, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're lost. We now move to the matters that are in today's agenda. I'll just give you a chance to put those up on the board so we can see them. Sorry, so with regards to um, the second part of the report that I had. We'll do that after we pass these. Yeah. Uh, so we received the report, acknowledge the change in framework, continue to provide residual disinfection and continue to work with Tomata Arawai. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hands. So One, oh, so we do need a mover. Move, a mover and second. Sophie, move, second. Bob. All those in favour, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All those against, please raise your hands. Declare it carried. Uh, now, Deborah, we'll come to the matters that you wanted to raise, and they could be part of the formal. We could we could move and second them uh, as councillors want to. Or I can just see David's advice around the reporting that's going to come to us. And if he. Um, instead of, so that makes it really formal that we are giving an instruction to staff as to watching that yeah, report. Yeah, that. That's fine. Council. Just, yeah. Um, I want that highlighted that it should be in the minutes. So after a move and a second, I'll say. Second. Yeah, right. Right. So D, E, and F. I'm talking to. Um, I don't know that I understand D, but I don't think we're in a position to be able to do that because we don't know what the Taumata Arawai expectations for for exemptions for each scheme will be because they will be different. So it will it can be done, Deborah, but it'll be done over a period of time, and with respect to E and F, that is. Procedural take a bit of time, but procedural. So I'd, I'd suggest that that it could be as much as six months before the answers come back. But it's incumbent on on the exemption application and understanding what what it is that they. Uh, well, basic, basically, so once we get the Springston one, which is next in line through, and we're able to compare the two reports with regards to the variations in the reports, trying to understand the standards given that we know that Springston, since 2008, is a new bore, it's, it's state-of-the-art, it's fenced, the only thing it's not in is a housed building. Um, basically, with regards to its compliance issues, which would be an exceptionally high standard, I would suggest, um, basically, with regards to drawdown, there is not a lot of lifestyle blocks in the particular area. Um, it's large cropping. Um, there's no dairy farms up above it, um, and with regards to agricultural assessment. So I, they were, they're really two different schemes, and plus the community are uh, on a reticulated water supply. De Deborah, can so, I jump in there? Because your D is pretty much the same as my D. My D says, reviews the process and cost of effecting improvements that require huts. And coming back to my point, we are able to do your D but until we get the, the scheme assessment. So, we need yeah, yeah, but yeah. Your, your D and my D are pretty much the same, and we just pick them off as we get the exemption reports. Yeah, thanks, Deborah, for putting the forward. Shane, for seconding. Shane, is there anything you wanted to say on them? No. Uh, Sophie. I think um, I'm not entirely certain, based on what you said, David, whether this is the best way to get this information, but what I think we're asking for is... Um, we're talking about the annual plan at the moment and potential rate rises and everything else. And is it feasible to get a high level idea of how much we might be looking at in time for talking to people in the middle of the year to see if they do actually want to cut? Because we know from the high cost of living, we don't want high rate rises. Yeah. Doing this work will quite possibly require that. In fact, it will require it. So well, how quickly can we get that information together? even if it's just high level based on what we know. So you, you'll, you'll get it two ways, I guess, or three ways. The third one is the is the um, scheme-specific ones. But you will get high level. But 
also in the not too distant future, we will have the responses to the Rakaia Hutsman. And I think that's giving the directive that you're looking for, at least initially. Just so. And everyone, I'll just go around the room to see if there's other people. Okay, because I've got a response to the debt funding. Chance the movie, you'll get to okay. speak at the end of this. Right. Malcolm. Moonbeams and rainbows, I'm sorry. Um, we, we don't know what D is till we know what D is. Uh, the cost of providing chlorine fill is between three and six grand a household. How many households? Um, this is this is the stuff of submissions to the annual plan. And that's where it should lie. I will not be supporting it. And if you're looking at rebates, you've got to factor in the rate and costs associated with that. Thanks, uh, Phil. I guess my question is to Deborah is that uh, along the lines of, um, you obviously, it's the protest about the coronation in the water. And is it stronger? Should we be stronger? Should we be having, um, should we be talking about how we as a council actively oppose um, coronation in, 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 a, in a legal, systematic way? Um, I, I, I think it's an interesting first step, but maybe we need to go a, a lot further. Yeah, Grant. I think um, Deborah's raised an interesting concept. I suppose the, the concept Deborah is raising is that um, is it more economical um, to continue with the current network chlorinated and remove chlorine at the delivery point, or is it more economical to to pursue a non-chlorinated network from source to delivery? Um, and that probably, while it's, while it's a really good idea, Deborah, I think probably that will fall out of once the exemption decisions are made, then it's up to the council to say, do we invest a lot of money in delivering non-chlorinated water in the whole network, or do we invest in providing targeted non-chlorine supplies at houses? Then it becomes an issue of how you fund that. And it may be that um, if ratepayers wish to take advantage of that solution, we could create a rating model which individual householders would actually get a unit attached to their house and pay it of well, all five or ten years with their rate, rates or whatever it is, or there may be a maintenance contract with the board. The funding would follow that, but I think the, the concept's good, there, but I think that probably it's for a later date, I'm, guess, I'm thinking. Thanks, Grant. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think that D um, is covered in what David has already, well, we've already just passed, that we will understand all of our supplies and that we do want to continue securing um, what the expectations are going to be, but that can only be done as on an exemption by exemption basis. So that's already passed. We just did that five minutes ago. Um, and the second and third parts of that, I agree with what Grant has just said around uh, the timing and the full cost of that won't be known until we can compare it to the exemption cost, which is still some months away. So it's not, I'm not against what you're saying. I just don't think the timing's right. And I don't have enough information to be able to, for us to all go, yeah, that's the right thing to jump into now. So uh, I, just, I won't support this as it is, um, but like the intent. Elizabeth. Um, this is a note for, for Murray. If you could please have a look into the different types of filters because the trihalomethanes um, are not taken out by every filter and so they still pose a risk um, as shown by one of the papers that I read today where the lady's still receiving skin disorder even though she's got a filter on her property. Great. Any final comments from Council? I'll give Deborah the chance to um, offer anything back. Deborah. Okay. I just want to highlight that all of these improvements and hopefully all of these costs that we're actually putting in to try and secure a secure water supply is debt funded, which means that we as ratepayers or the ratepayers aren't going to be paying for this. The whole of this is being debt funded. The debt funded will be handed over to Entity D and it will be spread out amongst all the ratepayers in Entity D with regards to how they're going to manage the scheme as, an, as a total entity. There are going to be overs and unders, but as a whole, it's like our district-wide rating um, proposal. And we are debt funding this. So, you know, I mean, I, I just want to highlight that the ratepayers at the current time are not paying the full cost of what this what this actually asks for. So why are we not taking advantage of it with regards to understanding how do we get chlorine-free water for our future and for our environment? We, our environment doesn't want 
elevated nitrate. Our environment doesn't want chlorine leaching through the soil substrate into our waterways long term. I mean, we're here to actually improve our environment as a holistic approach. And this is just not looking at it from a holistic way. And I just like that we should show some leadership and some, I'd like to say another word, but um, we should show some leadership and some ability to think outside the square, not just sit there and play nice in the sand, but while we're getting sand thrown in our eyes all the time. And this is the opportunity for us to show a different way of actually voting. And if anyone wants to add something else on there to strengthen it, please take the opportunity now to do that because now is your opportunity and your chance. Otherwise, we're just going to be rubber stamping, not looking at policy that is different from everybody else as to how we should show initiative and improvement. Thanks, Deputy Paul. Do you have something to add to this? Well, you could probably take it that way. Yeah. Three years ago, the council were nowhere near as passionate about not putting it on in the area that I live in, um, which seems a bit ironic to me. But anyway, I've, having been on calling for three years and in amongst a lot of people, well, yeah, okay, longer than that, now, said, but say the last three or four years, to start, we've got lots of complaints. Recently, I think I've had one in the last year but subsequently i decided i'd try something so i bought a filter a uv filter and a, and a uh, powder filter and it cost me two thousand two hundred and sixty dollars and i have no trouble with water but having gone to the guy next door and had a scotch with him the other night his scotch tastes no difference to mine so i think it's the amount of chlorine that's actually in it that is a problem and uh, so I think there are there are two. So I'm getting I'm, I'm totally opposed to calling, but the same as you I feel. I mean, I'm opposed to having our system, but as I say, I think the thing is that we've had this discussion for three years and it goes on and on and on. And if we're going to start looking at exemptions, I hope that we're going to be looking for my area as well as time goes on. Otherwise it seems particularly unfair. Thanks, Bob. D, E, and F. All those in favour, please raise your hands. One, two, all those, three. All those against, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five. To clear it lost. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to take a break. Uh, a 10 minutes break. We'll be back at 10 past four. We've got a few more items to get through today, uh, team. So if we can keep the break short. Thank you.
The meta is reports to come to on residents, groups, and committees, tab 14, page 87. And Denise and Nicola are with us again. And I'll read a mid question from Bob, I think. Uh, <laughs> but I'll get Bob um, back in the room before we move to that question. And others have lined up on the floor. So I'll, we'll, go, we'll come back to Bob. Uh, first up is Malcolm and then Phil. And I'll just, the rest of this afternoon, uh, the plan is to finish the public part of the meeting. There's a call to AGM, um, which was due at 4 o'clock, but we are still 4.30 or as close to it, and we will adjourn the council meeting um, once we move into PX at um, as close to 4.30 as we can this afternoon, but I know there's still a number of matters that need to be discussed, so that time frame may get pushed a little, and then we'll continue with the PX matters. Uh, this meeting will probably go, um, well, it's not estimate when we'll finish, but... Uh, there's, a few, there's a number of items we want to give consideration to and I'm not intending that we push items to a future meeting so if we can discuss them today and uh, would be helpful. Uh, Melvin. Yeah, um, uh, Grant made a comment earlier about being a long road uh, and, and um, I also remember Grant when um, we started this process you suggested that the springs would be the first ones as skinny pigs to go through the process of uh, changing our community commitments across to incorporated societies. And on that note, um, no, you're sitting in that seat, seat actually. Uh, I can find you the di diary, uh, the diary, the date. <laughs> yeah, let's just focus on what we've got. Um, incorporated societies, my community's been in one for 25 years, and we've still had a great relationship with this council and feedback and all the things we needed to feedback and do. Uh, I think there's a great deal of um, uncertainty and somewhat mischief uh, around the committees that haven't. And I'm very disappointed. When you look at Appendix 2 and you see the pros and cons in there, it is not the end of the world to be an incorporated society. It's not the end of the world to not be seen as a committee of council because we will still be there to, to sit in on their meetings. We still need to feed that. We're still on the phone. And I ask you to take a look at the committees that you've got. Take a good look at those committees you've got and see how many of those people have been there for 10, 15 years. How, many, how, how well do those committees actually represent the communities that you now live in that have grown in some cases by 50 and 80%? Um, and and from what I've seen, it's increasingly hard to get younger people in the community or new community members to get involved in residence associations because they don't necessarily feed back through them. It's not their way of doing business. They use snaps in themselves. They ring your local councillor directly, or they come in here through the front desk. So I do not think that um, uh, changing the structure for these last handful of committees and helping them move into incorporated societies, which I very much support the staff doing, showing the pathway, um, we can still have that community connectedness. It is a change by name um, and not changing a hell of a lot of the nature. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, Bob, we were mid question from you last time round, so I'll get Phil to ask his question and then come back to you. Phil? Uh, yeah, well, so my question was along, um, thank you for the report, by the way. And I think it's it's um, it's great that we are, we're enabling these, these these groups to become the incorporated societies. Um, and look, I guess I wanted to raise the uh, residents association, wasn't Ralston residents association, and then and the um, West Mountain, both of which have great volunteerism, and they've got great representation, and they're incorporated societies. Um, yes, we're currently working through with the with the residents Rolleston, uh, the Rolleston residents association around terms of residents and, and MOU. And that's because there's the uniqueness of the community will will will, will be re will re reflected through through those documents. But it will end up being a much richer, much vibrant, and much truer and authentic uh, re re representation. Uh, as as you say, Malcolm, um, as the community's changed over the last um, a few few years, the Robson Residents Association has been around for I don't know, Jens is over there. You'll probably hold up some things in it. Probably about four hundred years. Yeah. And um, the community in Rolleston is much, much bigger than it was when the Rolleston Residents Association started. So going through a TL um, MOU process is a, is a really robust thing. And we should be doing that with all of our, our groups in the next six months while they decide 
how they're going to grow to make sure they've got true representation around this table. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. And Denise, I will give you a chance to respond to any of the questions that have been raised uh, if you need to at the end. Um, I think Bob's the last speaker, though, so after yeah. this, we'll get that opportunity. Bob? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the way, Denise. But no, was, I was approached by a chair of a committee this week who has been told that the minutes are not to go to council anymore, and that to me seemed quite sad. But uh, yeah, um, I think there's several points I did not make. One is um, the assumption that the minutes are the best way to communicate uh, what what residents groups are, are thinking about. Um, the other is that residents groups are fully independent of council, and so you want to keep the requirements on them as light as possible. They shouldn't be required to be providing information, otherwise um, they're not fully independent of council. And it may be that residents groups are wanting to include in their minutes things that are actually not the business of council, they are the business of residents groups in, in different areas and than where council is. I think um, the best interests of community is served when uh, the residents groups determine what issues they want to bring to council or, or what issues they want to hear from council and um, invite council to be part of that process or, or um, use some of the existing mechanisms. So I guess I would suggest that minutes are not um, necessarily reflective of the best way to, to communicate with council and would want to encourage um, residents groups to see that that, that direct interaction is, is much more um, useful for them and that full independence means that they should be allowed to decide what information they share with council and what information they don't. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry I still disagree a bit um, because uh, I believe as far as they're concerned they were a committee of council, they've changed away from being committee of council, they still want to inform that they were voted in by their community and most of these have had large numbers at these meetings and they've been voted in as part of a spokespeople for their community and one of their easiest ways, it might not be the best and I can concede that, mm -hmm. but one of their easiest ways to get some of this through the council is a set of minutes which the council would look at. I still, and they think, well, there's a couple, like two or three people, and their both chairs they feel that council really isn't interested. If council are going this way, they're not really interested anymore. And I probably feel the same, sorry. And Bob, that's probably something for the community's com subcommittee that we've now set up to now think about, and you will be the chair of that group. So thinking about how that connects will be a matter for the future, um, for a future meeting. Uh, Elizabeth and Grant. Um, thank you for you, ladies and gentlemen. I, I see it as um, a really good step forward. Uh, Bob, I totally hear what you're saying, and I'm in the middle. So whilst I'm like Bob, I share history, and I'm quite a person who likes to, to do the same thing, I also want to be progressive and to whittle things down to the easiest possible method. And I can imagine that staff probably don't, they probably need to spend their time wisely because time is money for us. We're paying you guys to do your job and the last thing you want is you to be waffling through lots and lots of minutes i've been on plenty of committees and you get really very really repetitive minutes and long-winded minutes that as you say not relevant to council duties and so i think that there is, would be an easier system what is the easier system is there one out there already that you've got set in motion or have you got something in the pipeline or you yet to consider that i just i think there um as we have done with uh, previous reports to council as well as previous correspondence with committees talk to them about a variety of ways to engage with council depending on what their issue is and I think it, the um, what the Melbourne ward has had the experience of one um, dedicated staff member who has previously gone through the minutes um, no other ward no other uh, community committees of council have had that 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 staffing input and um as as nicola was saying in terms of the independence of these groups when council starts uh, that was initially a request rela related to the importance of making that information publicly available which a resident group may choose not to make publicly available and it is at their discretion how they share their communication. But also there are there is legislation associated 
with the um, with the council when it starts to receive information um, that may may result in in consequences that, that the, the resident group doesn't want to happen, but it is a it, it is a requirement of local council. It's a it's a big piece of machinery of government in that in that regard. But yeah, so so just in terms of that, there are just the usual mechanisms, and we can certainly um, put them through in the minutes in terms of um, how they can if it if it's about a an inquiry about. Um, uh, uh, a, a footpath or a broken window that they've noted there's a snap send solve um, function there's there's if they're wanting to make a booking they can call this number facility booking they can call this number we've done that previously and we can we can send it through in the in the minutes if that's a if that's of interest but that has been shared with the committees previously and it's also been um part of previous reports on this topic Thank you, Grant. Um, why do people join community committees or residence group in general? They want to get stuff done. They want to see their communities improved. And they have felt with the existing structure, there was a pathway to the council to make that happen, either through having a councillor appointed to their committee, which took concerns back, the minutes being read at the council and action points being raised and someone actually actioning them. The fear that's being articulated probably from Bob um, is that the response is pretty bad now. It'll be even worse if we don't have the minutes and don't have a councillor going to these meetings. And so if the model was better, I'd be lining up here saying, this is brilliant. And I, th I suppose what concerns me is that we haven't even got this really off the ground and you've got the Rolleston Residents Association endeavouring to do in terms of reference and memorandum of understanding. Well, clearly it's a fail already because they're having to make a new arrangement. <laughs> and why, why wouldn't that be expanded across the whole network? And so... You know, we haven't even started this process and we failed. And the other thing is, is that, you know, we talk about the last time this came to council, I think Deborah, you might have seconded it. We moved a motion that any requirement for community committees to leave would be voluntary. So don't we need to rescind that motion before we start saying we're going to out, out, them, out the door? Because that motion still stands. So I'm not aware of anywhere in this report that says, the motion um, of voluntarily leaving, not being a community committee has been rescinded. Um, so that's still on the table. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that concerns me. I mean, I suppose it's more of a representation review issue, but what's the Melbourne Community Board going to do if, you, if their members are not going to these um, committee, committee things? What are they actually going to do? So. Thanks. Um, I, I guess just in terms of the reason this is being revisited is, is because of the legislation which has discharged those committees means it has come back onto the table for further discussion. Um, and I, I'm not going to comment about the Melbourne Community Board. Um, this this is n n separate to, to that discussion and the representation review. I think the terrific thing about what good engagement and communication uh, and understanding where our communities are at. Just because we're not appointed to a council committee because we don't make appointments to outside organisations as a general rule, there are some that we partner with on things. Um, we would encourage councillors to consider these residence associations and whether that's monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly or six-monthly, depending on what the organisation is, that's part of the role of being a councillor. Uh, and so this isn't to try and stop you being a part of things. It's just saying there's not going to be um, a person that must be at every meeting because they're no longer a committee of council. There's still, com still community committees in our community with, with views that will need to be shared and transferred back to us. Can I make a brief comment on that? Because the way it's structured here, it appears that if we go to those meetings with no minutes coming to the council and no correspondence mechanism, they will give us a bundle of, of issues and say, here you go, chat, off you go. So it'll, it'll create more work for councillors. Can I make a comment on that? Uh, yeah, Phil. So, uh, the thing about it, uh, uh, is that we'll actually have independent communities deciding how they want to actually do it. And by sitting and having a conversation with them at the beginning, it's not us saying at this table here, this is how your relationship's going to be. We'll meet up with the Ross Residence Association, we'll work out what's best for them and us. And then... Uh, we'll work part of that mechanism will be how we communicate backwards and forwards, how we share, how we attend, that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's, it gives all the power to the, to the residents' association, and you're right. 
it is broken at, 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 at the moment because at the uh, residents association meetings they had at Ross and they had seven people going there um, for a population of 50, of um, 25,000. Sorry, I'm getting too easy to myself. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you for the discussion that we've had on this. Uh, we've been very thorough in going through. A number of reports that David mentioned earlier have been presented to date. Uh, we've got item one and or 1.1 through 1.6 and recommendation two. Need a move and seconder. Malcolm, seconder. And Phil, thank you. All those in favour, please raise your hands. This is recommendation one and it's recommendation two. I haven't gone with any, that's at the front of the agenda. I haven't included anything else. So, what's your amendment, Deborah? Um, I would actually like that they would be discharged. I want to make quite clear that they will not be discharged until they have actually been sold. So, because, yeah. well, Deborah, if you want, we can take them one by one, and that way you can vote against the particular one that you want. Yeah. Well, no, I don't want to debate yeah. the issue. What I'm saying is, if you want to vote against a particular item here, so we'll, we'll vote on 1.1 and then we'll vote on 1.2 and then we'll vote on 1.3 and if you want to vote against any one of those in particular then you can uh, have your say on each of those so uh, the mover and second are happy to move all of them though so we don't have to yeah. go back through that yes right 1.1 council reappoints the five community committees all those in favor please raise your hands one two three four five six seven okay uh, those against Carried. carried. 1.2, Council. You would like that recorded, so you vote against. Uh, if you call a formal division, then we'll note everyone that vote. Just say you're against as voted. Yep. Do you want your vote against? Noted. Thank you. 1.2, Council will communicate with committees to support them in planning transition. All those in favour, please raise your hands. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Those against. You'd like that recorded. Okay, so I'll just make that recorded. Uh, 1.3, uh, Council will just agree to discharge the committee um, earlier if requested by the committee. All those in favour, please raise your hands. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Those against, raise your hands. 1, 2. Great. 1.4, Council will not require committees to hold elections or for committee members prior to their discharge on or before 30th of June. Please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those against? One, two. Uh, 1.5, council support committees to meet the requirements of committees of council until they're discharged. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against? Thank you. And 1.6, council will provide committees with free meeting room hire and minute taker if required for up to one meeting per month until they're discharged. Yeah. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Yeah. All those against? Number seven, two. Carried. Uh, recommendation two, that the continuation of the 24,000 um, exists. All those in favour, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, three, and five, eight. Oh, anyone against? Carried. Carried. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Denise and Nicola. Um, we're just going to... Um, move to submission on variation to the plan change, uh, which is item 17. I know there's an accessibility report that we'll come back to straight after this item. Um, and there's three people who have highlighted a conflict of interest. Um, this is that we accept Southern District Council submission on variation one and provide the all necessary delegation to the team leader. Does anyone have any questions on this? It's um, been read. So we move and second it for it. Thanks, Shane. Second it, Lydia. Any discussion? On. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Anyone against? Declare it carries. Thank you, Robert. We now move to the yeah. Heritage Strategy Report. Uh, and I'd ask um, if Malcolm and the other three can come back in the room. Uh, Malcolm is going to chair this meeting while I take Council's proxy to the um, CORD AGM. Uh, and we're going to reschedule court to come back and give a full presentation in the new year um, to all councillors so that we give sufficient time uh, to that court presentation. So, um, Malcolm will come and take the chair.
Right. We're on, uh, excuse me, uh, people. Uh, no, here it is. Okay, here's a report, Elise. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, I um, did some of the, I did the work on the heritage strategy, which um, I'm, uh, is presented to you in the report today. I just wanted to give a very brief background so that you've got some context. Just a reminder of how um, the strategic heritage plan came into being. It was as a result of um, advocacy from the community over the long-term plan and the annual plan process, uh, where they were expressing concern about support for the preservation and promotion of the uh, district's heritage. And they called on the council to support the heritage more effectively and to commit to it with funding, protection and promotion. And so the council's response to that community, uh, to those community submissions, um, was to request that a strategic heritage plan be developed with input from stakeholders, including mana whenua, local history groups, and strategic partners such as Canterbury Museum and Heritage New Zealand. And Council also at that stage implemented a $50,000 community history fund to provide funding for local history groups for the operating and project costs. Um, Council also identified a number of goals that it wanted that strategy to achieve, and they were around things such as identifying, protecting, promoting and enhancing the district's heritage, um, assisting visitors and residents to learn about it, developing strong re working relationships so that we could collaborate with others, um, and exploring the dynamic interaction between um, heritage and tourism. And Council also asked that consideration be given to the heritage strategy strategies of other local councils uh, in New Zealand. So um, I engaged with quite a large number of stakeholders, spent time with around 70 individuals. Um, it included mana whenua from Te Taumutu Runanga. Uh, there were 14 local history groups, uh, most of them who I had the privilege of visiting uh, their sites and seeing some of the unique and interesting artifacts that they were uh, looking after. The Selwyn Heritage and Historical Network, young people through the Selwyn Youth Council and they um, undertook some work to do a survey and some Instagram polls um, and uh, also staff from Canterbury Museum, Heritage New Zealand and the Department of Conservation and then numerous council staff from across the groups who have different heritage responsibilities. In addition to all of that engagement, I also went through uh, all of the other district uh, heritage strategies, there exists about 20 of them, and um, undertook some considerable research to get some uh, background insight into the work the Council was doing. So the report in this uh, document in the public agenda provides context for the strategy on pages 99 to 115. And then pages 116 to 122 propose the vision, the goals, the outcomes, and the actions that will enable these uh, in order to be met. I think of note in the report um, is the amount of heritage activity that takes place across all of the different council groups already, um, or takes place with council support. This activity is discussed um, on pages 103 to 105. And the proposed strategic heritage plan builds on what currently happens um, and also adds new to that. I think that the strategic heritage plan represents a really exciting opportunity to shine a light on what is uniquely Waikiri Kiri Selwyn, um, our story, and to enhance community well-being and build connections for residents and visitors. So the report recommends that the council agree the vision for the plan, which is uniquely Waikiri Kiri Selwyn, sharing our rich heritage and celebrating our district's identity. Uh, it also recommends that council agree the actions subject to decisions in the annual plan 2023-24 and the long-term plan 2024-34 and it recommends that council notes that costs associated with implementing actions going forward also require consideration in the long-term and annual plan. Thank you very much. Um, I just congratulate you on the report. This is a piece of work that's been a long time coming. Um, retired Councillor Bland, if he was here, would be very happy to see this. He has been an advocate all the way along. And um, I can see Bob lining up to have something to say. Um, it's a great report. Um, you've certainly done the homework. Um, our next uh, is looking at the annual plan is where the rubber hits the road and finding the funding to make it happen. So um, 
Councillor Mokeford. Just really to say thank you for all the work that has been put in. Um, and it has been a lot of work, and the community are really appreciative of, the, of you actually travelling around, meeting all the committees. And I think the forming of the SOWA network will make a big difference to this. So uh, I hope it goes really well, and I hope all the other councillors look favourable at this. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Councillor McInnes. Yeah, thank you again for heaps of work. Um, I love the fact that it, this report um, acknowledges that history didn't start in the 1800s. Um, there is a much longer history in the district. Um, it's kind of interesting seeing a lot of the feedback that you were given, like um, from various groups. And I think that, you know, some of it where there's sort of mentions um, around concerns that things might be centralised, but it's not necessarily incompatible. There are some things that are worth centralising to enable the use of expertise and then other things that are absolutely better delivered at a local level. So it'd be interesting to see how that all pans out. Um, and the only other comment I was going to make was um, around the, the youth or the, the information available with us, that whole comment with there aren't many educational places in Selwyn outside the schools. I'm like, yes, there is. There's heaps and landmarks that you can go and find. We obviously need to find uh, better ways to communicate that. And I think we're, we're getting there with the various different media uses and websites and social media and stuff. But it's uh, it's expanding it so that it covers that sort of information so more people realise what we have because it's a pretty fantastic place to be. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Councillor Reid. Yeah, echo what's been said. This is a very thorough report and it's great, great to see. Um, there's one thing that I've been asking for some time that I've had some groups asking about is, is information panels. Now, I assume where it says on page 105 that the plan recommends actions to increase the contact and use um, sell and stories, the township trails app and developing a signage signage and style guide. So I assume that would, so information panels would be incorporated in that because as much as with the sort of having the trails trap and other thing, mm -hmm. app that you can use on your phone, I mean, it parts, areas, it wouldn't be possible to you be using those things. I mean, we, as much as we like to think that we're in the digital age at times is we don't have that access in certain certain areas and particularly like along the Little River Rail Trail, they were wanting to put some sign information panels and, and such like. Uh, but thank you. It's yeah, it's a really good report. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Councillor Moon. Hi, this is obviously one of my favorite uh, topics. Um I did want to just raise the question about the eighty thousand dollars for a feasibility study. And um, we earlier talked in council meeting about how we're going to have to claw back on some things. To me, 80000 for a feasibility study, I'm thinking about how much the communities would rather have that money in the pocket. Uh, well, in an in a ideal world, that would be the ideal solution, but part of me says this is the wrong time to have a feasibility study and that money I'd rather see used practically. Um, and there's so many ideas that come out, and I know that they've had a heritage week. Unfortunately, I was so busy I couldn't get to it. But I'm a big fan of um, what happens around the country, and I love Omaru, you know, their vintage week. And I think those kind of things um, are just fantastic to be able to produce that here. And we've got, obviously, having visited the Marae and, and seeing what we've got in terms of that, being able to incorporate their history into a public display or some kind of, as part of our historical weeks, would be amazing. Um, and I just... Really look forward to what you guys have going forward. Thank you. Can I just um, comment on the feasibility study? So the feasibility study um, is only proposed to proceed if initial work that will be done before then within current staffing and budget around what is the role of council and what is the role of other stakeholders um, in terms of preserving and promoting the heritage. Um, and uh, if that work determined that there was a role for council in that, uh, then it would be part of the annual plan process. So it would be subject to that decision um, uh, so that, that's the position of feasibility study yeah. right thank you I'm looking for a moment and a second for this recommendations 
Bob and Sophie. I'll put that recommendation. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you very much, Bob and Sophie. Now we move on. Tab 16, the accessibility report. And do you want to take that as read? I'll move that soon. I want to be positive. Uh, moved by the very positive Councillor Hassan and seconded by the very positive Miller. <laughs> <laughs> that one, Alex, extremely positive Miller. Thank you. Okay, all those in favour, please say aye. Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> Tab 18, I believe, is it? Hey. No! What? Chair normally asks us these questions on a report. <laughs> did, did you, did, my apologies, Councillor Reid, a question of the accessibility report, is that correct? Um, yes, I'll just ask um, one question, which is on... 138, which I've already talked start about. And this is another, another report, which is quite pleasing to see. Uh, this section 3.3 .3 is about footpaths, shared pathways, blah, blah, blah. And talk about the engineering code of practice being updated, which is good. That was a big process to go through and it's been checked off here. We see that there's been an accessibility audit of council's property facilities that's been done in June 2022. We saw what work had been done before. I'm just wondering whether this next slot of audit has that review. We're actually going to see that come to council to see what this is. And I'm also interested about, and I've brought this up before, as my understanding is one of the reviewer a reviewer that we have um, is actually living in Ralston. I'd be interested to know who how, <clears throat> how they feel about how they get around Ralston, not just with the facilities, but actually going around using the footpaths and issues in that regard. So we have a question somewhere in that? Yep, and I was wondering if that could be included as a piece of work as well. There you go. Um, just in terms of the facilities audit, the accessibility audit, they have been completed and they're currently being analysed with some priority setting. And so that is potentially, there will be elements of that that will come through in the annual planning process around the, the priority uh, expenditure around that. And yes, absolutely, next year's accessibility audit will incorporate some of the, cha the changes that get made as a result of those audits. The other um, question I might defer to Murray in terms of footpaths and, and the accessibility associated with streets and footpaths, et cetera, and whether or not um, there's any intention uh, that, that your group has in terms of um, an accessibility audit uh, going forward. Probably a good question for the first meeting of the transport and infrastructure community. But um, I say, look, um, yeah, we've adopted the code of practice, we are looking at wider footpath. Any new works will obviously have dropped down curbs and all the other bits uh, that are accessible. Um, and retrofitting uh, difficult areas is a bit of an ongoing part of the routine maintenance. And I can't speak with full clarity, but it'll probably be left to Graham and his team at the next at the first subcommittee meeting. Councillor McKinnis. Yeah, ladies, um, or oh, whoever's still up. <laughs> um, I have two questions, um, although definitely interested in that engineering code of practice thing, but we've covered that. Um, one is whether there is anything, any intention as part of this to, and it's probably more of a Kelvin team question, to be honest. The, the website is currently quite labyrinthine um, and difficult to access information on there. Um, so just wondering whether that's part of our uh, things to be changing. Um, and the other one is regarding quiet times. It's mentioned on page 143 about quiet times in the libraries and at Selwyn Aquatic Centre. Um, my main question there is it 
whether it would be possible at some point to program them not between 12 and 2 or as at other times as well. It's not particularly accessible between 12 and 2 for most people. They tend to be at school or at work. Um, and I have absolutely no idea when Selwyn Aquatic Centre has a quiet time. It's not programmed in anywhere or available for people to find out. Thanks. Okay, um, so I might just defer to Nikki Singh as you're in the room um, to respond to that, which was around the quiet times and the programming. Nikki or Matt, if you want to speak to that. And um, and I guess the other area is Calvin might want to speak to some of the thinking and the planning that they've got underway and, and the enabling services team about about the website and, and any work going forward. So I might start with you, Calvin, and then bring Nikki or Matt up. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that our website could be a, a lot better and part of the, the program over the next 24 to probably more months because it takes some time is to do a review and a refresh of our website and, and improve our digital services and, and not only will it be improvement around accessibility and, and ease of, of use but also increase our ability to transact online. But it, uh, it will be something that will come back to council at, at, at a due course. Thank you. We can look at the times. So you're absolutely right, and it's timely to actually look at them. It's good having those quiet times, so it's something that will continue, but we should review when we have them. So we will talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, um, thank you, staff. Thank you, Council. We've already voted on this matter, so I'll we'll move on to Pat 18 and I'll tip the chair back to the Mayor. Uh, thanks, Malcolm, for sharing that part of the meeting. Uh, we're now on uh, tab 18, page 161 of today's agenda Council submission on amendments to the National Environmental Standards for Plantation Forestry. Is George here? Great, George. Welcome to the room. Um, do you want to move on seconder for this report? Malcolm, thank you. Seconder. Uh, Nicole, thank you. Are there any questions that you have of George? There is, Sophie. Um, George, you know, just give us the key highlights from there and then um, Sophie will come to you. Right, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, councillors. Um, the report I put forward to you on the agenda is seeking retrospective endorsement of a submission made on the uh, Resource Management National Environmental Standards for Plantation Forestry Regulations 2017, saving us time. I'll just refer to that as the NES. The NES um, manages um, activities related to plantation forestry. Um, the, um, the district plan can manage matters outside of the NES. Presently, the NES does not manage um, activities related to carbon forestry, which is an emerging forest model at the time of the NEA. Uh, <laughs> carbon forestry was not. Um, you hold it down, you just press it. Oh, thank you. Subjects. Uh, carbon forestry was um, not as prevalent or emerging as it is now, and there's a regulatory gap, gap in the standards as it relates to. Um, carbon forestry or carbon farming. Um, ultimately, the amendments seek to address this regulatory gap of um, carbon farming and to ensure that the effects of um, carbon farms are managed in the same way as rotation or plantation forestry. Um, there's also proposals to enable councils to control the location and scale of both plantation and exotic carbon forests and um, seeking to improve wildfire risk management from both uh, plantation and carbon forestry. Um, the um, time frame for a submission was particularly tight and um, I did seek a extension in line with the mineral forums extension and um, provided um, a submission to the Ministry for Primary Industries um, just before the uh, grant of extension. Um, ultimately, um, these carbon forestry is going to be a key element in uh, meeting our climate change targets for 2050 um, in terms of um, net removals, not just gross emissions reduction, but emissions abatement. Um, there's some real issues, though, with the proliferation of exotic forestry, um, particularly with um, them being 
um, competitive against other land uses such as uh, sheep and beef, and there's a clear lack of regulation for these uh, for these emerging forests. Um, I'll um, probably leave it there, but the rest of um, the details regarding um, the changes to regulations are in the report and also in my submission. Thank you. Thanks, George. Uh, Sophie. Yeah, kia ora, George. Um, thank you for your work. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'm afraid my only comment is a perennial complaint um, it, on page 164 of our agenda. It says, see, climate change considerations, negligible climate change implications, except that the entire thing is about carbon forestry, the ETS, the ERP and everything else. Um, it would be good to acknowledge that that is literally the purpose of the forest. So I get that it our submission is probably going to have negligible impact, but the purpose is, is there. So, so <laughs> cheers. Thanks, Sophie. Did we have a move on seeing that? Yes, we did. Um, any further comments? All those in favour? Oh, Grant, sorry. I, I suppose the, the key thing I want to reiterate, I suppose, is that the potential impact on our catchment is huge, particularly in the in Melbourne High Country where we're already experiencing significant difficulties around wilding pine populations and the risk of of, of this sort of carbon forestry coming in en masse, um, particularly um, when we haven't completed the SNA and, and you know, in our um, you know, and the post district plan, they're not actually in place yet. So um, I guess we need to be really vigilant through this process that we don't get awareness. Yep. Uh, all those in favour that we uh, Rich particularly endorse the submission. Uh, say aye. Aye. Anyone against? Please uh, to get carried. Thank you, George, for that. Thank you. That is the final matter in the public um, agenda. There's no signing anything signed or sealed that we need to approve. And we've, and we've done the public forum um, piece. We've got to wait for for each of those. Councillors are happy with that? Yeah, happy to move public excluded. Thank you, Sophie. And second of Malcolm. Um, we'll just stop the live stream and say thank you very much for those that have um, been part of this meeting. I hope you've enjoyed watching. Chair, yeah, the, the clarity is tab 17 being passed. Because I know it went to tab 18, but I wasn't sure that tab 17 was actually. Yeah, we passed it when they were. Yes, right, thank you. Yes. Yep.